All right, everybody. We'll uh, get the fun started here. So, uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm Steve Dye, Legislative Director for the Water Environment Federation. Thank you, everybody, for being here in the room, as well as the 60 or so, I understand, people that are online virtually. Um, so welcome to the National Stormwater Policy Forum. Uh, hosted by WEF and Nas Water Environment Federation and the National Municipal Stormwater Alliance, co hosted by the National League of Cities and National Association of Counties. Um, this is a, uh, we've been doing this now for, boy, I don't know, at least five, six years. Um, and it's, we had a little blip there where it was virtual, and it's great to be back in person. And despite the fact some of you are virtual, we'll love to see you here in person with us next year, hopefully. Um, so a few housekeeping matters here as we get going here. Um, so the as you see, there's a sign over there for the restroom out there, out that side door. There is in the corners here, uh, trash as well as trash uh, and recycling out in the lobby there. Um, you see here, for those of you in person, there is a Wi-Fi network. Um, you could use those credentials there to get into the system. Um, and the only other um, important, I think, thing to note is that this is a closed to press event. So if you are with the media, with the press, um, you this is all on background. We're not going to kick you out of the room. We're not going to kick you off the the, the, the uh, virtual, but this is all on background. So no direct quotes or affiliations, please. Um, so yeah, I just really quick here you hopefully everybody picked up uh the materials out in the lobby there um our national um water policy flight our recommendations document um also a couple of postcards that that uh, epa puts together that are be to, to be distributed in communities across the country to help them uh help your communities understand how stormwater impacts your uh help impacts them and then our little postcard our little uh card there for the wef water 2050 uh virtual game it's a it's an app that you can play uh and uh it's kind of cool where you kind of di different challenges to make the world a better place in in the water space uh and that includes storm water so it's a new little thing that we put together so excited to do that so um with that i'm gonna hand it over to our two hosts here uh carolyn burnt and uh sarah germont uh carolyn is the legislative director for the national league of cities and Sarah is the Associated, Associated Legislative Director of Environment, uh, Energy, and Water Use with the National Association of Counties. So thank you, everybody, and uh, thanks for coming. Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning to those online um, on the West Coast. I'm Carolyn Barrett with the National League of Cities. Um, pleased to welcome you all here today uh, in person and online. Uh, we're pleased to host this event with our partners of Water Environment Federation, National Municipal Stormwater Alliance, and National Association of Counties. Uh, for those that aren't familiar with National League of Cities, we represent 19,000 cities, towns, and villages across the country, uh, working with mayors, council members, and city staff. The majority of our members are considered small communities of 50,000 or less. Um, and we also have 49 state municipal leagues across the country, unfortunately for us, not Hawaii. Um, I hope you'll consider an NLC a resource to you on stormwater issues and water infrastructure issues broadly, um, as well as sustainability and climate issues. And of course, we know there is a connection on, on both of these. Uh, this is a unique moment for cities and counties with major pieces of legislation that are sending funds directly to the local level and providing opportunities to invest in our nation's water infrastructure, make progress towards local climate action goals, build community resilience, and more. Uh, the federal funding opportunities will open the door to many communities to receive much needed funds. Uh, some of it might be for the first time uh, they're receiving these federal dollars, but we know there are challenges at the local level in applying for these grants, staff capacity and managing and complying with the grants and a host of other limitations. And we also know there are new regulations forthcoming at the federal level for local governments and water utilities around drinking water standards and water quality. Uh, from the lead and copper rule to the PFAS regulations and more. So I look forward to our conversation today on these timely and important topics for local governments. 
I want to thank all of our speakers for being with us today and sharing important regulatory and congressional updates and discussing these policy issues that are impacting the local stormwater management. And I also look forward to connecting with each of you here today on how NLC can support your work at the local level. So thank you all for being advocates for your community, for lending your voice and expertise in today's conversation and with the federal agencies and with Congress. So thanks for being here. I'll turn it over to my colleague, Sarah. Thanks, Carolyn. Um, my name is Sarah Gimon, and I'm the Associate Legislative Director for Environment, Energy, and Land Use at the National Association of Counties. Um, I want to thank the um, uh, Water Environment Federation and the National Municipal Stormwater Alliance and NLC for co-hosting this event with us today. Uh, NACO represents the nation's 3,069 counties, boroughs, and parishes across the country and promoting our vision of safe, healthy, and vibrant communities across the country, which is why we are so pleased to be hosting today's uh, event. And I hope that you can view NACO um, as a resource and a tool to learn more about the county role in both stormwater um, management, particularly with the historic funding coming through the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, and of course, today's uh, conversation is particularly relevant with the activity occurring at the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, as Carolyn mentioned, with regard to lead and copper and, and PFAS and, and everything else sort of coming through the pipe. Um, we're really excited um, with all this activity and all this funding coming through. Um, you know, 70% of counties are considered rural. So as they're looking at these new opportunities, there are um, some considerations I think to, to be aware of, whether it's staff capacity, technical expertise, and, and things along those lines. So I'm um, looking forward to learning more um, uh, today and um, excited to, to get started, thanks. All right, thank you, Carolyn, and thank you, Sarah. Um, so I uh, now have the distinct pleasure to introduce uh, the Water Environment Federation's Executive Director, uh, Walt Marlow. Uh, he is pinch hitting kind of, but not really, for Scott Taylor, who is our uh, the WEF uh, Advisory Committee, uh, Stormwater Institute Advisory Committee Chair, who uh, unfortunately uh, had some travel uh, problems. His flight got canceled. So, uh, but uh, we are, we'll maybe get him a little later today. But with that, I'm gonna introduce Walt and then I think Walt will ha hand it over to Seth Brown. So, yeah. Hey everyone, uh, pleasure to be here today. As was mentioned earlier, it's wonderful to see people back in person as well as on the virtual component for this kind of thing. Uh, there's so much we can do virtually, but uh, sorry to the people that are still virtual. There's a special magic of getting people together in person and the serendipitous uh, conversations that happen and the introductions and things like that. So I want to say thank you to all of you for taking your time to come to D.C. Uh, and put that personal time in and the commitment to making a difference in the stormwater sector, because you all know you work in this area. Has there ever been a more important time to deal with this? the challenges of climate change, uh, intense development around the country, infrastructure funding issues, uh, the political challenges that we have in trying to get things done right now in our country. There's no better time to come together to talk about some of these issues and really move them forward and make a difference for the people uh, in the communities where we live and serve. And that's, and that's one of the things that I think is so different about people who work in water. It's really about the communities that we live and serve in and really making a difference in people's lives every day. So again, thank you for coming together today. And I'm gonna turn it over to Seth Brown to give us a few more remarks and really get the uh, day going here. So thanks. Thanks, Walt. All right. Um, all right. It's my honor to introduce our keynote speaker. Before doing that, I wanted to make sure everyone has had a chance to get an agenda out there if you don't have it. Um, there's also our congressional summary document, our ask document. So go check that out as well. Um, I don't know if there's any of the logistics, Bianca. Restrooms are over there for those who are in person. Um, and it really is. I mean, Walt, you, you're right. Being in person, it's 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 been great. This is a wonderful space. Can't uh, thank you guys enough for NL at here at NLC and NACO and Steve for all the work for all the years, five or six years we've been doing this. This is great. So, and I know this is the start of Water Week, right? So I think of st stormwater starting off Water Week, 
with the most important topic, right? Right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so just for those who are online to uh, who may not have the agenda real quickly, we're going to hear from a great keynote speaker, uh, Evan Bernoski, who I'm going to introduce in a second. We're going to hear from uh, some con con congressional staff on both sides. We're going to hear about, like you're talking about the political dynamics, what's going on in the Hill, and, and Steve will be kind of ushering that through. We're going to hear a great panel on climate change and emerging contaminants, and then we're going to take a break for a little bit. We all need a break after for these events. Uh, then we're going to hear from EPA uh, for a little bit, and then we're going to we're going to walk through some of these uh, specific uh, asks on uh, Congress that because we're thinking about this as a fly-in event next year. Maybe we'll have more of a fly-in component to this. That's a goal for for all of our organizations here in the future. And then we'll wrap things up by hearing you know what's going on at WEF and in NAMSA. So anyway, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Evan Bernoski, who's got the coolest title I've ever seen, and I want this title. He's the Chief Stormwater Policy Advisor with Virginia Department of Environmental Quality. Um, prior to uh, this position, he was the Associate Vice President of Government Affairs with uh, the Home Builders of uh, Association of Virginia. Then he also, before that, worked with uh, the National Home Builder Association of Home Builders, and Michael Middlehauser's here from that. So waving the flag, because obviously land development is a big part of the whole stormwater conversation. Um, Another thing that's interesting about Evan's background, he was, we're here in the district for those, again, who are online. Evan was really instrumental in setting up the stormwater trading program here in the district, which is now being looked at as a model around the world and around the country, something that I've had a personal interest in, academic interest in. So uh, Evan, Evan had the, the vision for that. Um, and his background, just so everyone knows, he's got a background in, uh, or a bachelor's in uh, agricultural science from Rutgers, and then he's got a master's in environmental policy from my alma mater. University of Maryland. So without further ado, Evan Bernoski. Really uh, appreciate that introduction. And thank you also to everyone um, who has organized today's event and also um, attended. Uh, it really is um, definitely an honor to be speaking with you all um, with what I understand is your first reconvened in-person meeting. Um, and so uh, the pressure's on for me, but um, hopefully you will agree with me that we're doing some really exciting and innovative work in Virginia. And I'm really excited to tell you about it. Um, so just, Bianca, am I using this? Okay, great. Um, okay, so uh, just before we start, since this is a keynote, um, just uh, you know, point of uh, levity here. Um, those of you who uh, who know me well know that these days there's two things I like to talk about. Uh, one is surface water, and one is my 10 week old daughter. Um, and it's not necessarily in that order, uh, but um, this is us uh, out recently um, at Hewlett Point which is out near Kilmarnock, Virginia, uh, which is um, one of, I think, the most beautiful sets of um, sort of tidal marsh wetlands in the Chesapeake Bay watershed uh, and its property that's owned by the Department of Conservation and Recreation. It's a special place for us uh, and it motivates me every day when I go to work. So uh, today um, I wanna start and I wanna talk to you uh, about a few different topics. Uh, first is just generally some of the transformations that we're doing at the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality. And I want to talk about how stormwater fits into that essentially new vision. I'm then going to go through a couple of different projects that I'm managing for DEQ, um, a consolidation of our erosion and sediment control and our post-development stormwater management regulations, uh, an effort to develop a new handbook for the state, updates to the Virginia runoff reduction method, which is the set of compliance spreadsheets that we use for compliance with post-development stormwater quality uh, criteria performance standards. Uh, and then something that um, we're planning to come in the next calendar year, uh, which relates to our post-construction offsite uh, stormwater compliance program. I'll sum up with uh, just a few opportunities for engagement, and then I understand that we have some time for questions. Uh, so just to go ahead and start, um, when uh, I came into DEQ under Director Roban, uh, the agency revised its mission statement um, under the Yunkin administration, healthy state and local economies and a healthy environment of Virginia are integra integrally related. Balanced economic development and the protection of our environment are not mutually exclusive. 
And that is our vision. And that is every day what we are trying to implement. With that in mind, um, I am a political appointee of the Youngkin administration. And this is the leadership um, at DEQ. Uh, as you can see, we are run by um, our new director, Director Mike Roman. Uh, I report directly uh, to Director Roman, and I manage multiple, as I mentioned, special projects uh, as Chief Stormwater Policy Advisor. Um, our third political appointee is also a deputy director position. So first, I want to just talk about um, an effort to consolidate Virginia's erosion and sediment control, and also stormwater management regulations. So um, in this slide, I'm really showing you what ultimately is the legal backing of Virginia's construction and municipal stormwater programs. So it starts actually in the middle with our statutes, the Virginia Stormwater Management Act and the Erosion and Sediment Control Law. Stormwater Management Act, as you would probably imagine, is construction phase post-development and also municipal stormwater compliance. The erosion and sediment control low, uh, law is active development. That then moves into the regulation and then ultimately to the permit. The regulation component has always been confusing and it's always been a challenge for the development community. Uh, the reason for this is the development community often has to go to two different locations to determine what the minimum standards are, what the requirements are for meeting compliance at a development site. And so uh, three years ago, DEQ initiated an effort for the first time to consolidate those regulations, but that effort stalled uh, due to COVID uh, and some other reasons as well. But then when Director Roban came in, he made it a priority, and I'm happy to say that We've just have issued that for uh, public comment. Um, we expect it to become uh, effective uh, later this summer. And for the first time, we'll have a consolidated set of regulations. A second item is the 2023 Virginia Stormwater Management Handbook. And the handbook effort, sorry, starts really on the left here with this image. And that is a 23 inch high stack of documents, guidance, technical memoranda, existing handbooks, regulations that relate to construction stormwater in Virginia. Much of this is extraordinarily outdated. The white document at, or the white book at the bottom is from 1985. The green book, which is the state's erosion and sediment control handbook is from 1992. The blue book, which is our post-development stormwater uh, management requirements, go to 1999. And then there's that large stack of regulations. One of those uh, sets of unmarked documents is actually a draft stormwater handbook. That is a continuing cause of confusion. Um, and much of the material here is internally inconsistent. So particularly, for example, around BMP specifications, it's not possible to compare specifications for post-development stormwater management from the blue book to the draft 2013 book. Um, it's also, a lot of this information is outdated. I don't need to tell this group how far stormwater management science research technology has come since 1985, 1992, 1999, or frankly, even five years ago, right? And so we're really excited to consolidate all of this and to update it. And when I started, I uh, initiated a procurement process to find a contractor to come on board to assist with this effort. Uh, we um, issued that RFP uh, last year, and uh, we got several great responses. Um, after vetting internally, we selected uh, Arcadis, um, and Fernando Pascal uh, here today uh, is the project manager for this effort. And we are working with them uh, through a um, really holistic, integrative stakeholder advisory group process. Uh, we have 60 member stakeholder advisory group process that represent um, a really diverse set of, uh, uh, of interests and uh, organizations, uh, including Virginia sister agencies, uh, utilities, environmental groups, um, trade associations. Uh, we come together monthly, Arcadis drafts content, issues it, we get feedback, incorporate it, and uh, we will be moving forward with developing the handbook um, and also uh, making it available for public comment. I'm looking at some really interesting ways right now as well uh, to host it online, and we're pretty excited about that. 
Um, just a couple of other quick content uh, items. Uh, when we first uh, convened the SAG, my um, directive to them was uh, to use a term that Governor Yunkin uses regularly, which is that we want to make the best in class stormwater handbook uh, in the world. I know that's a lofty goal, but um, we know that Virginia historically has a very strong surface water program, and we only want to make it better, and we think we're on the path to doing that. Um, you know, I made this slide here uh, to start to just show you essentially the diversity of information that we are updating, that we are incorporating into a stormwater handbook. When I started in my uh, position, um, one of the first things that Director Roban asked me to do was to essentially write a white paper. So we had some internal consistency on what our goal was for the stormwater handbook, um, both uh, within DEQ and then also externally. And so, you know, as you would do, um, when I started, I started doing my research, picked up the phone and started calling people and said, what type of information and content do you want to see incorporated into what will be this new resource? And one of the best ways I thought that I could represent that was in a word cloud. And so um, the smaller fonts are what I heard the least often, even though they're still important, and the bigger fonts are what I heard the most often. And um, you could see the diversity of content that we're including in the handbook, but the two biggest fonts here, which I think are both pointing out, are post-development BMP specifications and erosion and sediment control BMP specifications. And I'm really excited about the progress that we've made here. Uh, on the erosion and sediment control BMP specs, the existing green book I showed you has 39 erosion and sediment control BMP specs. Through Arcadis's uh, guidance, we're now looking at 54. And what I'm really excited about there, particularly utilities throughout the state, they have to regularly submit documents called annual standards and specifications that essentially show how they're going to manage their stormwater program across the diversity of um, uh, of projects that they manage. And because they want to use new BMPs that we haven't formally adopted, they have to submit variance requests. And this is a really significant amount of time that it takes for us, DEQ, to review and approve these documents. We're hoping that we can really shrink down that process and make the permitting process far more expedited in Virginia. And I think we're going to get there. Post-development BMP specs, um, I believe our existing number was 12 or 13. Um, our staff in DEQ have tried for years to keep those specs updated. Um, they've done really great work, so we're actually really starting from a solid base. Uh, we're considering or are discussing adopting one or two additional ones, um, and I'm really excited with the progress that we're making there. Uh, with the handbook, um, our uh, goal um, is to have it available for public comment uh, this winter. And this is our draft outline. The second item I wanna to talk to you about today uh, that I'm working on is updating again that Virginia runoff reduction method. And so in Virginia, um, our post-development performance standard is a water quality standard. It's 0.41 pounds of total phosphorus per acre per year that sites have to meet post-development. And they have to obviously incorporate or design their sites uh, through the introduction of post-development BMPs or other site design in order to achieve that requirement. The existing VRRM compliance spreadsheets are um, uh, regularly require updating. There's various constant values that uh, change. So things like uh, event mean concentration, rainfall amounts, et cetera, um, that uh, regularly require updating. The last time they were updated was in 2016, so we were long overdue. We saw an opportunity with this update to completely revise the VRRM and make it consistent with the Chesapeake Assessment Scenario Tool and the Chesapeake Bay Watershed Model. That cuts out a lot of work internally for DEQ because now the information that developers and the information that design engineers incorporate into the compliance spreadsheets is information that we can transfer directly to the Bay program without having to essentially do internal translation as we report on progress toward meeting the Bay TMDL. We're really excited about that. With that said, um, I brought on Virginia Tech to help with this work. It was a lofty goal. 
Um, they were uh, essentially taking Chesapeake uh, Bay watershed model land covers and adapting them into the Virginia context. These are some of the specifics. But what I wanna show you um, is a success story that we uncovered through this process um, that I don't think if we weren't focusing on this work, we ever would have found. Under the uh, top um, chart there, you can see these are the current land covers that are in the Virginia runoff reduction method. And you can see post-development, we regulate for three different land covers. So there's forest, managed turf, and pervious. And actually there's an error there that should be forest slash open space. When we first looked at this, and when we first tried to match up the Bay model, we wanted to split out forest and open space. But look at what's outlined in red. We found that the Bay model had managed turf with higher phosphorus loading rates than impervious surface. And that didn't make sense. It just didn't make sense to us. Now, there is some academic literature that does show for certain types of soils, the loading rate from managed turf can be higher due to phosphorus fertilizer applications, but we have a ban on phosphorus fertilizer applications in Virginia. That ban became effective in 2013. And so those numbers really were something that we called into question. We went down a path to try to assemble the actual statistics on the sales of phosphorus fertilizer and the use of phosphorus fertilizer in Virginia to actually plot out what those numbers were. This was a long effort. Going back and piecing that data back to 1987 was a significant challenge. As you can imagine, when you look at uh, state or uh, local data sets, there's often gaps, there's often challenges. I will tell you right now, my colleagues um, at the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Sciences went around to various different people's desktops and tried to access uh, old access databases to see what information they could find. Um, that effort essentially failed. <laughs> and so we actually bought the data from the group that we reported the data to over the years. They actually sold us the raw data. And that's the American Association of Plant Food Control Operators. To their credit, my colleagues at VDAX have subsequently made vast improvements. And what you can see is the orange data is the data that we reported over the years. The blue data is the data that VDAX has been reporting to that third party. And so we know that we cleaned up our game and that trajectory is correct. We also know because there's such an overlap that we have the correct historic data. Now here's the kicker, the green line that's what the Chesapeake Bay watershed model says we're applying in Virginia for urban lands for phosphorus fertilizer applications. There's a really significant delta there and that's a challenge. And we're working with uh, EPA and they've been really responsive, the Chesapeake Bay program in trying to help us to think through what exactly is going on. They've actually done a um, essentially one-off scenario and model run for us. And now our draft final numbers, uh, which are subject to change, um, actually show um, in just about all cases, except for currently one soil type, that managed turf is as we would have expected it to be below impervious. And so I really am excited about this. Um, and I think that's really demonstrating how we're on top of our game and we're really working hard uh, to get some of those uh, pollutant loads down. My last point, and then um, I'll keep it open for uh, questions. Um, commodity trading platform. So uh, in Virginia, um, we definitely have multiple market-based um, surface water management programs. Uh, we have um, a thriving uh, wetland and stream mitigation marketplace, um, but we also have a post-development stormwater credit program. Um, and Seth uh, mentioned DC and my work in DC uh, there on a retention standard. I see some of my former DC colleagues um, in the audience today. In Virginia, we have a program that we've had for multiple decades now that's very similar in structure. And it allows development sites to achieve their target phosphorus load offsite by buying nutrient credits. Uh, our goal um, in uh, the coming year 
is to make an online platform where we can begin to track all of those credits, uh, get statistics together, see what's actually happening in those marketplaces. So um, I just wanna conclude with two quick points. Um, all of these are public processes. Uh, I would encourage any of you who might be interested in what we're doing to either reach out to me uh, or come to a meeting. You have to drive down to Richmond um, because our hands are a little tied in doing virtual meetings due to FOIA and other whatnot. Um, but we do meet monthly on the handbook process. All of the items that I talked about today uh, will be issued for um, public comment in line with the Administrative Process Act in Virginia. And so um, be on the lookout and uh, definitely uh, review it when it comes out and give us your feedback. We'd love to hear it. So again, thank you very much. And uh, Seth, do we have some time for questions? Thank you. Yes, thanks. Thanks, Evan. Yeah, we've got 10 minutes for questions. So we got plenty of time. And just keep in mind that Carolyn, you've got a microphone back there. So that while we can all hear each other without microphones, folks online cannot. So make sure that when you ask a question, find a microphone. So anybody have anything they want to start off with in terms of, uh, of questions here? Okay. Dave and then Elizabeth, I'll come over here. Hi, great presentation and great initiatives. Thanks for all that you're doing for the state. Um, or Commonwealth, I should say. Thank you. Uh, so question is, um, are any other states in the Chesapeake Bay working to do something similar to Virginia to improve the Chesapeake Bay modeling? So I am familiar with obviously multiple efforts. And, um, you know, I think that much of uh, the feedback to EPA gets communicated through the principal staff committee. Um, and so that should definitely be your first place for information and hear what the principals um, say and their positions. Um, you know, definitely on a um, sort of staff level, um, DEQ and MDE and Pennsylvania DEP and Delaware DNR all uh, are heavily engaged in the multiple um, working groups um, that really make the Bay program sort of the collaborative effort that it is. Um, I will tell you uh, that specifically uh, on phosphorus fertilizer, yes, that has actually been an ongoing topic of discussion. And each of the jurisdictions um, that actually track that data, and some do not, um, have been trying to pull it together and report it um, to EPA. Um, and we're on steady progress. I think at this point, three states have done that. Um, I will say one last thing, you know, my position is unique. Um, as far as I'm aware, uh, there aren't any other politically appointed uh, people who are working specifically on stormwater. Uh, and so, um, you know, I personally, because I really appreciate this field, think that um, that's a really thoughtful and uh, really useful uh, appointment. Um, so uh, hopefully you all agree. <laughs> yeah, I will say, yeah, I mean, I think we need more stormwater czars. I know, Dave, I'm sorry, if you want to hop in here. I wish we had more stormwater czars in different states. I'm just making a pitch for those who got the power to make that happen. That'd be great. The other thing is when you're speaking, if you can identify yourself and your affiliation, that'll help folks, especially those that are that online. Thanks. Can you, can you hear me? I'm Dave Smith, Water Innovation Services. Great presentation. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, on-site rainwater and stormwater control. In, in, in a lot of states, efforts to promote on-site stormwater and rainwater management are proceeding almost like in parallel or separate from state efforts to um, clarify how more centralized stormwater management is going to happen. Can you talk about how this is being addressed in Virginia and you know what, if any, role DEQ is playing to try to maybe harmonize uh, on-site and more broadly uh, centralized uh, stormwater and rainwater management? Are, are you talking about like on-site collection and like, you know, using like cisterns as a BMP or are you just talking about on-site treatment versus off-site treatment? I'm just trying to- I'm sort of thinking the full range from, from rain barrels to people who are actively, you know, doing on-site, you know, collection for, for uh, you know, irrigation use or, you know, uh, other kinds of things. Sure, thank you. Um, well, you know, what I will just say and um, is that uh, the VRRM does calculate um, compliance on a specific development site, right? Um, now, off the top of my head, I don't know um, 
if there is essentially like a threshold level that a site needs to meet before it can go off site, I'd have to go back in the regs and jog my memory. Um, so um, that's sort of how we calculate compliance. Uh, we are updating all of our BMPs. Um, we um, are incorporating um, phosphorus efficiencies, updated phosphorus efficiencies into all of those different BMP specifications um, where we can. Um, we are also uh, trying to incorporate uh, total nitrogen efficiencies and also water quality treatment, or excuse me, uh, uh, volume um, reduction um, through those BMP specs. That's about as much as I can say right now. Um, I think, you know, uh, your your heart of your question uh, may actually relate again to sort of what the uh, relationship is between that on-site, off-site, and maybe we could keep talking about that. Thanks. Yeah, Mike. Ben, hi, Mike Middleholzer, National Association of Home Builders. Evan, in your presentation, you talked about one of the key things that Virginia is trying to do is finally to document and locate where the design standards are for uh, stormwater control, and that's as you mentioned, been a constant source of confusion for the residential construction industry. Can you tell us a little bit more about that process and specifically not only uh, locating which design manual is current, but moving forward, would there be more of a process to notify the regulators and the regulated community when these design manuals and standards are updated? Great, great question. Um, so, so to start, and um, this actually brings up two points that I neglected to mention, so I'm glad you jogged my memory. When I first started in my position, uh, Director Roban tasked me with identifying every single document that has ever existed in the history of Virginia that relates to construction stormwater. And that's actually um, a fascinating <laughs> uh, uh, a task um, because in the history of Virginia, the stormwater program has bounced around a bit from agency to agency. And um, it really started with the Department of Environmental Quality then it went to the Department of Conservation and Recreation, then it went back to the Department of Environmental Quality. And throughout the sort of process, different documents kind of got lost in translation, they got buried behind um, sort of password protected, um, uh, antiquated uh, uh, websites. And so um, all of that information we pulled down and we uh, made available for the first time online on DEQ's uh, website. And so now for the first time, you can go there, you can click on stormwater, and you can look at literally the entire universe of every document that we could ever use through the plan review process. Now, more specific to your point, Mike, um, the handbook effort is, 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 is an attempt to try to clean all of that information up get out of the way all of the guidance that never was formally adopted, guidance that currently exists um, sort of as a one-off document, that'll be incorporated into the handbook. The handbook will actually be a formal guidance document. And then we will actually go through a deregulatory action to get rid of all of that old content so it's no longer confusing. The other point that I think is really um, important to mention is that this effort to develop a new handbook is going to establish a new baseline. And so one thing I mentioned is I'm working right now to find essentially a platform that we can put the uh, web or that we can put the handbook uh, on a website. And one of the platforms I'm actually looking at would allow a user to go into the handbook and on a line item by line item basis, actually comment on what it is that they like, what it is they don't like about guidance in Virginia. And we are writing into the handbook a adaptive management, a, re a, a, a regular revision process. And we're actually talking about this uh, in the SAG right now. But where I think we will end up is that we will convene a group of uh, important stakeholders on some type of recurring basis and they'll review the comments and they'll basically identify which ones they actually wanna focus on for our handbook revisions going forward into the future. Um, and so I think that that right there, you know, it makes the entire process more accessible. It brings multiple new stakeholders into it. Um, and uh, I'm pretty excited about, you know, where we're gonna go in the future. Excellent. I think I think we have to wrap up at this point so we can get to the next, uh, the next uh, panel. So thank you again.
All right. Great. To, uh, to Evan Bernowski for uh, sharing information with us about what's going on in Virginia. So thanks again. All right. Thank you, everyone. And as uh, as the next folks are coming up, thanks. That's great, Jeff. Um, just if anyone needs Wi-Fi, we've got little uh, tent cards in the back. So if you want that, that information is back there. Um, also, for questions for those who are online, they can use the question feature, right? And we'll try to track that as the day goes on. So sorry, Steve, I just wanted to give a little bit of housekeeping. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, thank you again, Evan. That was fantastic. Really appreciate it. Um, so the next uh, part of our program is the congressional update. Uh, this has been a, a standing thing in this event for a, a long time. And I think uh, one of our speakers has done it multiple times for us already. So <laughs> we welcome her back. Uh, but um, so it, it, we're going to have a little bit, bit of a presentation by each of them and then some time for Q&A. So please uh, think of questions as they're speaking, uh, anything that comes to mind that you would like to ask them. Um, so the Congressional Update panel will consist of uh, Shannon Freedy from the office of Senator Ben Cardin, and then Ryan Hamilton from uh, the office of uh, the Subcommittee on Water Resources and Environment on the House uh, Transportation and Infrastructure Com Committee. Uh, Ryan's boss is uh, Chairman Sam Graves from the House T&I Committee. So I uh, welcome you guys on up. I think uh, Ryan will go first. We're going to have a few minutes from each of them, and then we'll do some Q&A. So thank you. Hi, everybody. Thanks for uh, having us here. I uh, really like these events when we can kind of get out of the office and uh, come and see all of you who have taken the time out of your schedules to come to town. And um, um, and it's great that we're doing this again too, sort of post COVID. So glad to see uh, uh, the full room here. Um, as Steve mentioned, my name is Ryan Hamilton. I am the uh, staff director of the Water Resources and Environment Subcommittee at the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. Um, uh, my boss is uh, uh, Sam Graves of Missouri, the full committee chairman, and also report to um, Chairman uh, David Rouser of North Carolina. Um, so I'll get right into uh, kind of what we're seeing here. Um, as you all well know, uh, over the last uh, um, um, uh, couple of years, uh, culminating with the uh, IIJA, there's been uh, an immense amount of uh, funding going into um, water and wastewater programs and um, um, kind of still seeing how that will, 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 will take effect. I think that um, from our perspective as um, coming from the, uh, the, the newer House majority, um, House Republicans, um, it was a fairly um, partisan um, um, vote in the House um, on, on, on the IAJA, but uh, nonetheless, um, we, um, um, you know, my, my conference wants to see uh, the money spent well and wisely and go to good use. And I think that there is, um, you know, that it was a very large bill that had a lot of different pieces to it, but, you know, I think that um, we can be supportive of seeing, uh, seeing the, the funding work well and go into a good projects such as the ones that you all are working on here. So um, I think that um, because of that um, pretty massive shot in the arm of funding, I think that um, in terms of the, uh, the uh, House Republican Conference, looking um, away from um, more large funding uh, exercises for uh, at least a, a little while and looking at implementation and kind of lessons learned um, or lessons learning as we go through this. So a um, couple of things that we are tracking is just sort of how this money is um, is being spent and to make sure that um, it's being spent efficiently and to make sure that um, those who are receiving it like you all are able to do the most with it. Um, so to that end, um, you know, we are, we're, we're tracking sort of any um, obstacles that uh, folks like yourselves might be um, uh, coming up against or um, just any other um, barriers. Um, so I think that uh, for the most part, uh, in terms of our work on IJA is uh, we're, we're collecting information, we're, we're, we're seeing what um, we're reacting uh, at this point. And um, I know that a lot of that money is still um, going out the door. So really, um, I value sessions like this to kind of hear what you are all seeing and kind of how it's going. And um, if there's any um, takeaways that we can get from that in terms of how, uh, how the program is, uh, is shaping up. Um, otherwise, um, something that, um, the, 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 that we've been focusing on as well is sort of the um, regulatory side. So I'm very interested in hearing about um, 
um, places where maybe um, certain um, um, the current um, um, permitting regime or any other uh, regulatory um, 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 processes that you have to follow might maybe could use some tweaking or some updating. So um, something else that I hope to get out of this is to hear if you all have any thoughts on on any of that. So um, I won't go on much longer and I'll pass it over. Uh, so thank you. I'm uh, Shannon Freedy, Environmental Policy Counsel to Senator Ben Cardin of Maryland. Uh, he serves on the Environment and Public Works Committee. It has jurisdiction over the USDA, uh, over the EPA, sorry about that, uh, and the Army Corps. <clears throat> and I've been um, a member of his uh, DC staff since 2016 um, and um, am focused on the environment, including water infrastructure. Um, and I think to use kind of echo that point in terms of implementation, I think it's a big theme of this Congress, right? It sounds pat, but it can be very time intensive. I think thinking about um, contacting agencies, connecting constituents to resources and tracking all of these uh, notices of funding opportunities kind of flying around, kind of refer to these as good problems, right? There's a lot going on um, and there's multiple funding streams, right? There's um, the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act, BIL, although it's not just a bill, it's a law. Um, and then also, um, annual appropriations, I think, again, tracking those funding streams. Um, I think our perspective in a personal office is not just that the funding is well spent. I think we want as much of it as possible to be spent in Maryland. And hopefully your delegations are doing the same on behalf of your jurisdictions. I think that that's um, a focus of ours. I think um, within the region, um, I think increased attention to urban and suburban stormwater via the Chesapeake Bay. Um, we had a recent proposed settlement on the Chesapeake Bay TMDL, the Clean Water Blueprint. And so looking to um, looking to EPA to kind of up oversight of Pennsylvania, you know, our neighbor upstream, where we've seen some uh, significant pro progress, but certainly com coming off of a you know, long period of uh, kind of underinvestment um, in that space. So I think that that's looking to agriculture, certainly as the largest source, but also to stormwater, which we see as the fastest growing. And um, so we'll be looking for ways to connect resources to support that effort and particularly um, looking to a program you know, that was funded, I think 240 million um, supplemented in the um, BIL, but then also thinking about 319 and other, other avenues. Um, I think um, in terms of um, you know, opportunities, there's the clean water SRF, right? We saw something like 15 billion. Um, I think it's significant that that funding is on top of these annual appropriations and that almost half of that is, um, is intended as grant funding in disadvantaged communities. So I think thinking about um, access to that funding, I think there's sort of this um, ancillary, you know, in a in personal office thinking about earmarks, right? Um, clean water SRF projects are eligible and that does include um, stormwater projects. So that's something that we're just resurfacing from that season. Um, I often look to the state's intended use plan to, to um, in terms of uh, qualifying projects, you know, it's not required, but it helps really serve as a guide, kind of a proxy for, for readiness for those projects. So that process is ongoing, kind of phase one is done, now we're turning to phase two. Um, and I think that um, the committee um, often is, um, EPW really works to um, operate on a bipartisan basis. So the it's drinking water and wastewater title is what got plugged into the IL, and that was I mean, a pretty bipartisan product. And I think that um, looking to um, looking to the committee again really is kind of eyes and ears on that oversight and then potential tweaks. You know, if we learn that things maybe are not working, so really interested in your experience. Appreciative of uh, WEF for having us um, in partnership with uh, with NIMSA and for um, and for use of this space, which is awesome, um, and for you all for making time. So happy to go further. There we go. Uh, thank you, guys. Thank, thank you, both of you. Um, so I'll throw a, a quick question out there, and then I hope some of you all will have some questions as well. Um, so I guess, Ryan, sort of going your direction on the first question here on um, the subcommittee that you're the staff director for, um, you guys probably have uh, some things on your legislative agenda that you're looking at doing in the, in the year ahead. I know in hearing what the uh, Senate Environment Public Works Committee is looking at. They are going to focus in on the WERDA bill um, this year and uh, aren't really going to delve deep into anything with uh, legislative reform around um, or oversight of the IIJA uh, 
in, in, uh, implementation, but um, you talked a little bit about your interest in seeing how the, the BIL or IIJA uh, is going to play out. Do you, do you foresee anything legislatively in your subcommittee or within the full committee uh, moving on the in the next year ahead? I mean, worth word. Uh, I, one other thing that yeah, we're very supportive of the Water Environment Federation of is uh, is legislation to extend NPDES permit terms beyond a five-year window, allowing for communities that are in good compliance don't have to go through that rig and roll every five years. Um, so I don't know if there's anything that moving in your subcommittee that you would see a vehicle for that or anything else happening that would be interesting to this group. Yeah, thank you very much, Steve. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, yeah, I think um, we are still... Um, well, to back up a little bit, um, the the House passed uh, HR one uh, a few weeks ago, which was a um, sort of a, a larger permitting bill. Um, we had a um, one one small part of that uh, in in the subcommittee's jurisdiction, which had to do with um, Clean Water Act Section four hundred one uh, permits. But um, you know that happened um, that came together uh, fairly quickly, and we heard from a lot of stakeholders that. Um, stakeholders like yourselves, but also from others that, um, you know, there was a desire to look at some of those things um, um, in a little more depth. So I think we are going to to try to do that. Um, and then as we go through um, and we get more input, we may look at um, other uh, legislative uh, uh, actions that we could take. Um, you know, you mentioned the five to 10 year uh, um, 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 permitting example. That's something that um, that I think we're interested in, in reviewing a little bit more. So I think that, you um, we um, um, could expect to have uh, some more some more hearings on that sort of thing, and then um, also um, just generally speaking, um, you know, we hope to have um, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency uh, come up and testify. Um, you know, we do customarily have them come up at least once a once a Congress, if not once a year, to provide uh, their outlook on the on the administration's budget and kind of what's going on there, which provides a great opportunity for us to kind of check in on some of these things like IAJA or just other. Um, um, other uh, maybe more more uh, nuanced or smaller pieces, such as um, some of the um, um, permitting issues, um, to get their perspective. Um, but you are correct. Um, Worda will be um, returning to uh, our agenda as well. Uh, um, I think I was in this room a few weeks ago talking a little bit about uh, the uh, about uh, Worda, but um, I'm happy to do so again. Um, I think that. Uh, um, the Senate tends to uh, get started with word is a few months before the House does. This is common practice. Um, so I think that um, we are in the House are looking at um, opening up some sort of a uh, member uh, request submission portal on Worda um, in the uh, um, probably in the late fall, early winter. Um, this is slightly earlier than we usually do it. Uh, traditionally, we do it in the January of the even year. Um, for instance, Worda 22, the portal opened in um in January of 2022. And then the bill was uh, signed into law at the very end of 22. Um, I think in talking to my counterparts at EBW, we all hope to have things done faster or sooner than the uh, very end of the Congress, but um, sometimes we don't get to pick that. But um, anyway, so that tends to take up a lot of the subcommittee's bandwidth um, in those even numbered years, but we're not in the even numbered year yet. So those things that I mentioned at the beginning of, of, of the question, I think are, are what we're gonna try to focus on over the next uh, um, few months. Thank you. Um, questions? Randy. Thanks. Um, so one of the most consequential facts on the stormwater side is encapsulated pretty well in a graphic on the second page of the ask document which is that over the history of the clean water srf program only 1.8 percent of the funding has gone to stormwater projects even for the most recent five-year period in that time window that number was only a little more than three percent um Obviously, from the perspective of the stormwater sector, those numbers are too low. And I'm wondering if you have recommendations about um, how we might be able to get those funding numbers increased for stormwater within that program. Thank you for that question. Um, I think that um, I think that 
the kind of need to grow that piece of the pie and definitely significant. I think it's very apparent in the Chesapeake Bay you know, watershed where we've achieved a number of goals for the wastewater sector like 10 years ahead. So we're doing great there. Again, not, um, not on track in the stormwater space. And I think that um, you know, clean water SRF really is the largest funding source. I think it helps that what um, BIL has done is really grow that pie. So how can we make sure that within that pie that stormwater projects are competing well? And some of that is going to be, you know, state evaluations of projects, but I do think EPA um, you know, kind of has resources, particularly on the technical assistance side, and they've rolled out something new called water technical assistance, water TA, in which really anyone can request help seeking federal funding. So I think the hope would be that those avenues might allow kind of stronger applications. And again, I think, um, increased attention to water quality, certainly in the watershed is likely gonna drive um, you know, how those projects do. So I think that that's a big piece. Um, and um, yeah, I think I think um, thinking about how, as those allocations are made, you know, really working through um, those issues, so yeah. Yeah, I think um, also just, well, you know, work with the states that you're in to try to get them to prioritize, you know, how they should um, be directing their, uh, their their SRF decision making. And, um, you know, I do agree with Shannon that there's um, technical assistance can go a long way. Um, sometimes it's kind of ironic because you almost need technical assistance to be aware of technical assistance, but um, hopefully we can kind of <laughs> at least get the ball rolling here. And, um, and uh, you know, I think that, um, you know, disadvantaged rural communities um, could use a lot of the, the help here. And so we um, certainly appreciate that. And, uh, you know, I think um, working with EPA to uh, uh, to, to keep that uh, as a priority, which I, I think it is um, and um, in this case, um, but yeah, so I think we wouldn't want to hamstring the states, but we'd encourage you to uh, uh, bring this to their attention, which I'm sure you are. Yep, go ahead, absolutely. And if, again, if you're asking a question, I'm, I'm sorry, apologize. Shannon. And then just wanted to flag one other program, really more specific to stormwater, are the sewer overflow grants, the OSG. I know your asks sort of touch on some potential adjustments to the formula, but I think that's a really exciting new opportunity. Stormwater was really only added in as an eligible project use in 2018. Um, and we now see you know, states have received their allocations. I think we expect the funding to flow in Maryland this summer. So I think that'll be kind of a new bucket really dedicated to addressing CSOs and SSOs. I think that that's a place to look. Again, that's also going to be passed through, through states, but I think um, one more uh, place to look. Make sure you're flagging that too. And Senator Cardin played a really instrumental role in getting that program established back in 2018. So thank you for that. So I saw Chris, and I mean, I can't see Yeah, Chris, you've got to, again, if you're asking a question, please identify yourself. And then we've got another question over here after Chris. Uh, Chris French, I'm um, with uh, Hydro International. Um, one of the, the panel that's going to be meeting shortly after this one is going to be talking about emerging concerns within the stormwater sector, as well as the water sector in general, uh, toxic contaminants, things of that nature. And what we know now is that we're just learning about a lot of these different issues, that there is a lack of research money to be able to better understand the severity of, or what we believe might be a severe situation associated with some of these new chemicals, forever chemicals called PFAS, um, 6PPDQ, which is a new one that just came out of the Pacific Northwest, just learned about about three years ago. Nobody ever heard of it before then. So from a congressional perspective, as the people with the power of the purse, what can Congress do to kind of help elevate the research need in this field so that we can have a better understanding and give the municipalities who have permits the tools necessary to be able to address these concerns that their constituents legitimately have? Well, I think that um, this is an issue, like every, I guess everyone else, you know, I'm kind of learning about this myself and, and, and kind of would like to keep engaging with you on what um, sort of exactly the, the barriers are to getting the information that you, that you need on these, on these emerging contaminants. Um, I think that, uh, you know, emerging contaminants are, uh, especially in the case of PFAS, um, as everyone knows, is, um, you know, a real, real tough nut to crack. Um, and, um, one thing that I think some people are wondering, um, including myself from time to time is, um, you know, how does this interface with CERCLA and, um, is, is CERCLA the, 
was it really designed to handle this kind of a pollutant? And I think that that's something that I, I think about uh, fairly frequently um, as uh, you know, thinking about emerging contaminants and, and things like that, where there's, you know, it's not sort of the um, old style of uh, maybe you had a refinery or something in a community that you knew exactly where the pollutants were coming from, and now you're not sure, and now folks in the wastewater sector have to process them or, 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 or they're being passed through there. And so, you know, are the, is the current, um, are the statutes and the current um, um, regulatory regime um, designed to handle that? So that's something that I think a lot, a lot with uh, emerging contaminants. Definitely. I think too, um, I think the, I think the EPW committee is going to probably be looking at kind of two main levers, right, in terms of um, funding and I think resourcing um, municipal municipalities and treatment works versus uh, regulatory. I think there's some interest in advancing a likely non-regulatory package because I think there's going to be pretty extreme sensitivity to opening up CERCLA. So I think there may be an effort to thread that needle and um, we're sort of like, we're kind of seeing this play out in real time, right? As EPA kind of prepares to um, treat certain forms of PFAS under CERCLA. Um, and I, I think the, the challenge too is that kind of common sense application where we're really looking at um, the polluter pays principle, right? We wanna really be looking upstream. Um, and I think we can look to EPA's use of its um, enforcement discretion. Of course, that's not quite the same ironclad assurances you might see legislatively, but I think that's gonna be a lot harder to deliver. So I think something you may see is kind of an effort to signal that what we want is for, again, really the manufacturers of these contaminants to, to bear the most burden. Certainly a concern for Senator Cardin is, you know, the costs of treatment being passed on to customers since we're really working to reduce rates and, and increase the ability to pay. So I think that that is gonna be a big concern. And I think on the R&D side, you know, thinking about the um, Water Resources Research Act you know, that um, supports um, science centers at universities. I believe Maryland's is at the University of Maryland. Um, that's USGS is the partner there. So I think making sure where we've got limited resources, we're targeting really the, the most, um, most really looking for the most bang for the bucks. So I think looking to those um, as one place will be important. And I think yeah, kind of continuing to track how Congress responds. Yeah, and from the standpoint of um, emerging contaminants, not only PFAS, but as Chris said, 6PPD um, and microplastics and trash, things like that. Some of the hope is that these uh, stormwater centers of excellence that will be established uh, through the uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act provision that, again, Senator Cardin was instrumental in getting into, into the law. And then uh, now we've seen some initial appropriations for it. Those will bring some hopefully some resources to communities to help them uh, address some of those emerging contaminant areas. I think, Kim, you were next. Is that right? All right. Good afternoon. My name is Kim Grove, and I am with the City of Baltimore Department of Public Works. I also um, am co-chair of the advisory committee for the Stormwater Institute, and I want to thank you both for taking the time to participate in this event. Um, and I do appreciate that there, even though we have historically not had a lot of funding in the stormwater sector, that there is more that is available. Um, however, a lot of times when we talk about stormwater, we tend to focus on cleaning up the water, very similar to the Bay program. There's a lot of qualitative control and that that demonstration of a uh, quality improvement, water quality improvement is what gets the funding from the SRF loans. However, there's two other elements for stormwater management that tend to get neglected. One is flooding. And, and I do appreciate that um, FEMA has increased their funding, especially through the BRIC program. But the other one is um, asset management. And there just seems to be no funding sources that are really there. And many times, especially in cities, your storm drain system is your largest pipe. It has the opportunity to swallow an entire road. Usually that road has just been repaved um, with federal funding. And so if there, is there any way of, um, opening up the doors so that asset management for storm drain systems could actually get some funding? Um, that would be my first question. And the next question, sorry, uh, is, is while I appreciate a lot of the funding, it tends to be new puppy syndrome in the sense of it's a lot of new implementation, new, new controls that come in, and many communities are unable to keep up with the maintenance side of it. And so if, especially as we talk about green infrastructure, that maintenance element is really the success 
for those investments. So sorry for the, I, sorry, I took two questions. Okay. the question and, and um, know where you're coming from in terms of sinkholes as a, a Baltimore resident. I've been, I've been working around North Avenue for a while. Um, glad I was back online. Um, and I think, um, you know, looking to how states use the SRF funds, I think there are some flexibilities in the Clean Water Act. So I think that would be a place to look through, you know, how can, how can planning potentially apply? And I think, um, I think certainly an effort, I think a challenge can just be kind of crediting, right? Crediting members for funding for maintenance, right? Because it's easier for them to kind of cut ribbons and be, um, be um, recognized for that. And sort of how do we think about, you know, this maintenance brought to you by um, the EPA. So I think that there's some, some signals there to think through. Um, and there are some kind of smaller objective specific programs in um, that drinking water and wastewater title, I think related to asset management. I think the one I'm thinking of may, may just be a uh, drinking water program on leak detection, but can can think through you know any potential existing authorities, and um, I think it helps to have those ideas you know coming into uh, coming to the word of reauthorization. Like I said, we've seen that be kind of an Army Corps only bill, but I was going somewhere with, going somewhere, which was with um, so something new we have in Maryland is called Environmental Infrastructure EI, and it's a new I think it's a one hundred million dollar authority whereby the um, Army Corps can help fund publicly owned water infrastructure, and that does include stormwater management. I think historically that's been focused on smaller communities that kind of lack that capacity, but we're really excited to have this um, authority in Maryland. I think many other states, maybe most, you probably know best to do. Um, often the challenge is getting that new, new start in terms of the new puppy uh, through appropriations, but um, thinking through um, the use of that program and really making sure that it's through the lifetime you know, of the infrastructure. Yeah, if I can just kind of keep going on environmental infrastructure. Um, and I love the term new puppy syndrome. I had not heard that before. I'm going to use it all the time now. Um, so, uh, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, I think, um, um, as, as, as Shannon was mentioning environmental infrastructure and the, um, word of 22 for the first time since word of 2007 had new environmental in infrastructure projects in it. Um, what I've been hearing from folks is that, uh, I think a lot of, uh, the non-federal sponsors who are, um, justifiably very excited about this, you know, have, that bill was passed in, um, in, in December of 22. So, you know, five months ago, and then um, appropriations requests were due a few weeks ago, at least in the house. And uh, I think a lot of um, folks um, that were pretty excited to have that authorization have run into kind of some implementation issues. And so um, I guess, you know, to the extent that um, you can just work with the core, um, if you're running into these problems, or if any of your um, constituents or, or friends and neighbors are um, to just work with them and work with the core to get them to understand what these are. Um, because as I said, we hadn't ha had new EI in 15 years. So the current EI was pretty well understood by the Army Corps and everything. And so they would get these requests and say, okay, no problem. It's an easy tweak. But some of the new ones starting from scratch um, have not really been able to show capability in, you know, just a four or five month period. So um, I think that will take a little bit of time um, in working with the Army Corps um, to get that capability. And then that, then that can be shown to the appropriators who I think would be in a much better place to uh, um, uh, appropriate funding for it if they can get the thumbs up from the Army Corps. So just wanted to throw that nugget in there as well. I think we got one last question. Oh, I'm sorry. Can I, you sure? Okay. Well, thanks, uh, Dave Smith from Water Innovation Services. And I'm gonna follow up on a couple of the funding related questions. Um, you, you indicated that, you know, the states do have quite a bit of flexibility in deciding how to spend the infrastructure money that was passed through them to then pass through for projects. Um, and you mentioned the availability of technical assistance. Um, I wanted to share the observations that first, many states have not fundamentally changed how they're spending this money in any way. And um, if there is pressure on them coming from Congress or from EPA to spend that money very quickly, it's going to even further reduce the chances that they're going to consider spending this money in different ways, like for stormwater, for green infrastructure, non-traditional types of investments. And I would also note, few of them are investing in developing technical assistance capability that even addresses stormwater. They're not hiring people who know anything about stormwater to provide that assistance. So it, this, I mean, people really do look to Congress for guidance on how to spend money to, in accordance with Congress's priorities. And, and I think a, a lot of states and a lot of localities are feeling like 
you know, different outcomes were expected, but there's no change in the process for spending the money and therefore no reason to expect any difference in the outcomes. So I, I, I am I am skeptical about whether you're going to see significant increases in stormwater investments because of some of those problems. But I guess my my question, and there is a question in here, um, is do you think that there is going to be patience about spending this big slug of new money? Because there's a lot of concern about hearing about clawbacks from money that was appropriated years back that isn't spent in, instantly. And it's going to take time to build the capability to invest in these new things. Is Do you think there's going to be the patience about the pace of spending that's going to be necessary to enable spending in some of these new directions? Or is there going to be a lot of pressure, spend it right away, or we're going to take it back? Well, I think the pressure to spend comes from, you know, many different places. Um, and um, it comes from Congress in the sense of, okay, we cut the check, what's happening? Um, it comes from the administration in terms of, um, you know, um, that they ha requested this, the legislation and have it now. And, and, and then also there's, you know, political dynamics too, to show progress. Um, I do think that um, a, a great way to get uh, 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 Congress's attention and to probably uh, uh, greatly irritate certain members is to, to go to them and say that a lot of the money they got from legislation is being taken away from their constituents. So um, I think that that's a pretty powerful uh, <laughs> um, um, uh, uh, message. So, you know, to the extent that, um, you know, on a sort of project by project basis, or if it's, you know, a funding stream in a particular state to just keep Congress informed that um, something may, that was given may be, there, there may be a clawback out there. I think that that will get people's uh, members' attention uh, pretty quickly. Yeah, I think here your point about, you know, the pressure to both spend the money, the funding perfectly and quickly. Um, and I think that, I think the, the Senate early views this funding is intended to be transformational, right? To really fund projects that might not otherwise be happening. And I think in some respects, um, your marks are almost a microcosm of that because again, it's fun. It's members sort of choosing things that might not otherwise happen. Um, and I think that, um, I think that the point about sort of making sure that members are aware that this is happening, I think we may not know, say, if a, if a state is maybe having difficulty getting funding obligated for certain reasons, if it's, you know, if it's particular requirements, we sometimes hear from, um, municipalities having issues with, the uh, build buy America, build America, baba, ba, and can sometimes just even get an update um, so that a, that a constituent is informed. So I think that help, helping us know what's going on is very helpful. And I think um, I think in these implementation opportunities, sounds like it would be helpful to kind of um, kind of push in around that, um, around that. And I think in terms of annual appropriations, it certainly helps if we deliver them on time. So I think that that uh, point is taken too. Well, I think we're done. It looks, Fernando, it looks like you're itching for a question back there. You all right? All right. <laughs> well, yeah, and Shannon and Ryan are really busy. So we really appreciate you guys taking the time to, to hike over here uh, and spend some time with us and tell us about what's going on in the Hill, uh, sharing your, your insights um, and really appreciate you hearing from us. Um, so let's give a wound, welcome round of thanks to them. Thank you all. Okay, and uh, this is an opportunity now to, uh, and yeah, definitely thank you for your leadership on the Hill, Senator Cardin and others. Um, but this is an opportunity for those who have not, if you haven't gone out to, to uh, check out this document that's out, we've got those um, out. Oh, you, sorry, I'm in your way. Um, check this out, this, this outlines, or I could use this. This outlines, um, oh, it's louder. Um, this outlines congressional, like the congressional uh, priorities, articulates where um, NAMSA and where WEF are at in terms of our priorities and, and whatnot. And I did want to recognize there's a lot of folks in this room that were part of planning this event, putting this document together, both this year and in, in years past. So uh, for those who want to raise your hand, Fernando, Kim, and others, I know that you guys have been involved with in this. I appreciate it. There's a lot of others online that who couldn't be here. So we just want to recognize that that's that's the case. Okay, so we're going to pivot now and spend the next hour uh, working on, or talking about um, emerging contaminants. So Chris, you asked about emerging contaminants, and this is obviously something that's active in the context of uh, Congress, as we heard a little bit, and, and there's going to be questions about that in the future, but also in the context of uh, policy overall. So I'm going to ask the panelists to come up that are going to be 
part of this. We've got um, Sandra Pavlovich. Hopefully that's right. You don't kick me on the way up here. Um, Sandra's with um, NOAA, right? specifically the National Weather Service. I'm going to give a quick bio. So as people come on up, you're, you're good, Gary. Um, and Sandra's got a, she's got 15 years of experience in civil environmental engineering. So she's a technical person. She, she, she holds a position with a national uh, weather service focusing really on Atlas 14. And we're going to hear about Atlas 14 and the transition, I think, to Atlas 15. Again, if I'm wrong, you can, you can kick me. So, um, she's also, uh, University of Maryland, uh, alma mater. So we got a lot of us around here in Penn state as well. Uh, we're going to Dr. Dalma Martinovic. Again, if I'm, if I'm wrong, you can kick me on the way up. Um, she's with, uh, she's a professor at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota, my home state. So that's a good thing. And I appreciate that. And I know it's been an easy winter for you. So it's, yeah, it's easy to travel up here. Um, and Dr. Uh, Martinovich, uh, her, her, fo her research focuses on bioeffects based monitoring to prioritize chemicals emerging concern and their biological effects um, in complex mixtures, including stormwater. So obviously the, she, her work is really focused and is very appropriate for this conversation. And she's going to talk about some upcoming research focused on 6PPDQ, um, which has primarily been seen as something in the Pacific Northwest. Now we're seeing that this is more, we're, we're looking at this as, a, as, as an issue show, uh, popping up in other parts of the country. So this truly is a national um, issue. And then last but not least, um, Gary Bellin, American Rivers. Hi, Gary. Um, Gary's been with uh, American Rivers for a long time, since 2003. He's been doing great work over there. I say that because I've been around for a long time, too, so I can say that myself. Exactly. We're old. Gary's got also got a, a background in, uh, while he's working with American Rivers, that in his role is not technical. He has a technical background, which is, which is wonderful and really helps in these conversations. Um, he works with a variety of groups to, to um, looking at, uh, including other grassroots environmental organizations, business interests, local, state governments, federal government, all that stuff. So you, you cover all that stuff. Um, and he, well, like I said, prior to American Rivers, you were at Clark Engineering. So for a couple of years. So again, you have that background. So your background is uh, in civil engineering, University of Virginia, and environmental policy here in the DC and American University. So. Yes, that's well, well put. Okay, so uh, with that said, we're going to kick things off with uh, with Sandra uh, talking about updates to Atlas 15. So we're going to hear this. We're going to hear some uh, brief presentations. We can probably handle a couple of quick questions, and then we'll have hopefully have time at the end for a larger Q and A session at that point. So, uh, Sandra, if you're ready to go, come on up, and I'll get out of your way. And then there's the clicker right there. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you. Oh, you can hear me well. That's great. Um, so my name is Sandra Pollock, and I work uh, with within a national weather service, which is part of NOAA. And I'm civil engineer as well. And um, I started as a, a designing for stormwater infrastructure. So I've been with the NOAA for the past 10 years working on um, precipitation frequency standard. And today I'm here to provide a um, little bit information of national precipitation frequency standard, what is current standard, which is called NOAA Atlas 14, and our plans to update this standard and modernize it and account for climate change. And this new update uh, we are referring to as NOAA Atlas 15. Okay, just a little bit of a, a brief background. Precipitation frequency data serves as a foundation for built infrastructure nationwide, nationwide and supports prediction mission. Um, it's used majority of our built infrastructure leverages the data to design and plan under the federal, state, and local regulation. It's used for the stormwater design, for transportation, um, it's used by the FEMA, National Flood Insurance Program, and it's used also by the National Weather Service to, uh, for prediction mission. We are also providing um, the maps to quantify the severity and spatial temporal nature of the extreme storm events and their impact on communities. And you can see some of the maps that we provide to public um, for the extreme storm events that occur. 
So just a bit of a background. In 1950s, National Weather Service was given a role to develop precip frequency data for the reason is that they do not own or regulate infrastructure. They're independent organization solely focused on the science behind the data. And since 1950s, there are many different studies that were done um, by National Weather Service, but more recent study was uh, that we are working on. It was since 2000, 2000 when Hydrometeorological Design Study Center was set up with the sole responsibility to update the precipitation frequency estimates for United States. Unfortunately, for this product, we data sets we never had um, direct federal funding. Instead, the work for this volume was performed by the request and funding from states. And as a result of this funding mechanism, we were updating precip frequency estimates as volumes of NOAA Atlas 14. And you can see that in the past um, 20 years, we completed 11 different volumes and states are still funding this product. And we're currently working on two volumes, volume 12 for states of Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming, and volume 13 for mid-Atlantic states. Since we're developing estimates at different times, sometimes we have the boundary issues between the volumes of NOAA Atlas 14, which impacts, um, which poses issues for our users, but also uh, for us on the development side. That said, um, no Atlas 14 replaces and su supersedes the products de developed previously by National Weather Service. And No Atlas 14 product benefits from denser range gauge network, higher quality of data. Where we, at, at the time we were developing this product, we were developing at one kilometer resolution. We're providing additional um, durations and frequencies. And we also incorporated confidence intervals. One of the limitation of this product is that it assumes that climate is stationary so that we can rely on a past information to design for the future. So uh, with the bipartisan infrastructure law, NOAA received the first time direct federal funding to update and modernize precipitation frequency standards and account for the climate change. So where are we planning to go with this funding? Um, we are planning to leverage this funding to develop uh, the, to update the precipitation frequency standard as not Atlas 15. Over the past few years, we also worked with academia um, to um, look, at, uh, look at the impacts of climate change on the precipitation frequency product. And a result of this study, we developed the framework or statistical, we're applying a new statistical uh, methodology that can account for climate change. And we're looking to integrate climate projections into this um, standard so that the final estimates can be um, available for past and the future periods. Um, this fund, the, the research study that we worked on was funded by the Federal Ohio Administration. It was a multi-year study, and the results and recommendation from this research study is published on our website. I'll not go into it. Um, I'll just kind of briefly explain where we are that where we are planning to go with uh, No Atlas 15. We are planning to uh, display this information as two volumes: volume one, which was based on historical information, and this information because historical gauge observation, it will be also developed on one kilometer resolution and it will be able to model non-stationarity in historical data when um, the trend in data exists. This est estimates from this volume when developed, they will replace or supersede estimates from no Atlas 14. Um, on volume two, we plan to uh, leverage the information from global climate models and represents that information as an adjustment factors to volume one. And here in a slide, I think here in a slide, I'm showing the, uh, the estimates that were developed for as part of the research study. Um, so this is kind of like a similar information, just in a spatial um, 
representation because our product is developed in one kilometer resolution and engineers are using for it also watershed analysis. So this is our roadmap. We're expecting this project to, um, we're expecting to develop the estimates over the next five years. Um, the first step was to really publish the, the methodology and science behind where we wanna go with the Atlas 15 product and then brief the stakeholders um, um, on our proposed methodology to validate it and get a buy-in. And all the feedback that we received in the process will be shared with the development team um, when the project starts. We also uh, issued public notification statement, which is part of the national letter service process every time when we are updating um, a methodology or a product. And we also receive additional feedback there. And we also hosted a technical workshop with the federal partners. Uh, we had, at the beginning of this year, we had experts from 10 different agencies that use our product or they use our product to design derivative products. And then we shared and discussed um, plans for NOAA Atlas 15 and we received the feedback from there and that feedback is then further shared with the development team. And we also work on setting up the contracts and grant support um, to um, work on this project. And we are looking to start development or initiate the project in a, a next week or two. Since No Atlas 14, and we, this is something that we also want to continue with the No Atlas 15, re, uh, development process is quite rigorous and ex, it requires extensive quality control and significant stakeholder engagement. With No Atlas 14, we go through the peer review process with the public, we share the information, preliminary estimates, then receive the feedback, and then all that feedback is then integrated into the product the final estimates. And that process is needed to really get a buy-in from the uh, federal agencies and users, um, and also to develop a robust information because it's used in design. So with the No Atlas 15 development, we are looking first to develop a pilot study over the state of Montana to share it with the public and stakeholders to received that initial feedback and then not just on a science behind it but also on a web dissemination strategies how we're presenting this information how engineers are going to use it in their design and we recognize that at the same time that our community is also working on different projects so if they see quicker information of how we're what we're planning to do with atlas 15 they can uh, work also to integrate it into their processes we're planning to go over the go through the peer review process for CONUS in 2025 and on CONUS in 2026, receive that feedback, integrate it into the final product and then uh, publish the final estimates year after. So for a CONUS, for a CONUS area, we're looking to uh, finalize the estimates in 2026 and on CONUS in 2027. So, um, Bipartisan infrastructure law provides one time funding opportunity for us to revise the precip frequency standard. There is really a need for updating this standard on a regular cycle. And thankfully, with the uh, Floods Act that was passed in December, there is a language in this act that authorizes NOAA to establish a program that will be responsible for compiling, estimating, analyzing, and providing, communicating the frequency of precipitation in the United States and updating uh, this standard uh, no less frequently than once 10, every 10 years. However, the language exists, the appropriation has not been made yet, uh, but that would be a, um, a really good step for the program for the future. All right. Thank you very much, Sandra. Any we, we have time for one quick question and then we'll move on. Out there? I don't know. I don't know who's behind there, but you just tap on it a little bit, Robin. Hi, uh Robin DeYoung with EPA. I'm curious, thank you for this update. I was curious about when the data does come out, will there be any visualization tools or any other things associated with the data itself so it's easy to use and put into different uh, analysis or formats for others?
Michael Lim can I get back okay. there. Do you guys okay hear me? Okay, good. So um in parallel to the development, we're also working on a web dissemination strategies and how to enhance our uh, delivery of this product, particularly now that we're adding additional feature, meaning uh, uh, climate information. And so part of the, and we're working on it currently, and we're looking with the pilot study to share this information with the new web dissemination strategies and then get a feedback from our community on what type or the visualization tools, the, the formats that we're providing. We wanna provide like the basic features that currently and engineering and water resources community is using, but also enhance it to include um, the data for um, our engineering communities to integrate in a software or whatever tools they need. So that would be the way kind of to engage stakeholders and get the feedback what our community needs. Excellent. Thank you. So there's going to be more opportunities for questions at the end. We just want to get through all the speakers so that we can uh, can hear everything. But, you know, the, the what you're talking about with the Floods Act is something that's a priority for, for WEF and for NAMSA. And these tools are, as, as, well, as we've highlighted in our survey, we'll, we'll, we'll highlight this towards the end of this event. We need these tools. So I totally appreciate the work that you've done. So thank you very much. Dr. Martinovich, yes, please. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, contaminants emerging concern. And I know that my talk is maybe a little bit too technical when you look at the slides, but I promise I'll try to keep it understandable. Some of it is really kind of rich in detail that I don't have time to explain today. So um, one of the things I want to say is, um, I'm very happy to be here because um, I redirected my research program over the last couple of years to generate actionable data. That's that's really kind of what I've been doing with my work. I started more in, you know, esoteric basic research. And um, going back to one of the questions about funding, it has been very hard to find um, federal funding for the research on contaminants emerging concern, especially in the effects area. And this is due to a variety of complex reasons, but one of them is also that uh, some of the agencies uh, tend to really focus that, you know, we get money from, uh, like NSF, tend to focus on um, basic science and tend to um, underfund applied work, in my opinion. So um, what we have done uh, in the state of Minnesota has actually been pretty amazing over the last 10, 15 years. And we have done much of this uh, using the state funding, and I will in a minute tell you a little bit about the sources of funding that we have used. So next slide, please. Or do I have, oh, I have advanced. All right, here we go. We'll go faster now. <laughs> all right, so as you all may know, um, one of the big challenges when you study complex um, mixtures of chemicals, such as stormwater or wastewater, is that we just don't have time or money to uh, work contaminant by contaminant. And unfortunately, that has been the approach that we have been taking for many years, right? And in particular, the big problem with contaminants emerging concern is that, um, A, there's so many of them, and second, that their, bio that their biological effects are not characterized. So even if you measure the contaminant, biological effects are not known. So what my group has been doing over the last 15 years, we have tried to develop bioeffects monitoring where maybe we don't even need to know identity of all the contaminants. We just kind of sum up their total biological effects. And like I said, try to give some actionable data to the client. Um, another thing I want to say is that um, we started this work, uh, you know, in, in mid 2000s, and it, it was a slow work because at the time, the molecular tools accessible to us were actually very few. And even then we were kind of plugging away biomarker by biomarker. But very early on, um, even though I came from the world of wastewater, because that's where lots of funding is and, and there's lots of regulation is there, right? Um, we have kind of had interest in actually looking at the stormwater uh, runoff and also the CSO. So the data I'm showing here in this graph is actually from the uh, Metropolitan District of um, Chicago, greater Chicago. And basically very early on, we learned that uh, there is a substantive estrogenic activity um, in the um, runoff stormwater and CSOs that was actually comparable to the activity, estrogenic activity that they were seeing in wastewater effluents. And at the time, you know, that's what you hear in the news a lot. You hear a lot about the wastewater being estrogenic, but very little about stormwater in spite of this early data. 
since we have really um, collectively, you know, in toxicology developed this rich toolbox and uh, our federal agencies have done a really fantastic job over the last 10 years developing tools that allow us to go into the complex, um, you know, situations and look at the biological activity of a variety of chemicals. Another thing that's been very important um, if you're going to conduct hazard or risk assessment of these chemicals in complex mixtures is that this data is now um, deposited in a very organized and transparent way uh, on a variety of places, but one of them is the Comptax, dash, Comptax dashboard that EPA maintains. So what this means is that actually, if you look 10 years ago, we didn't have a lot of bioeffects data for chemicals, and we certainly didn't have tools to generate the data very quickly. So my specialty really has been using the tools that have been developed for the single chemical assessment and taking them to complex mixtures. And in particular, I've taken them to the places to demonstrate um, impact of BMPs or bioremediation and so on. And we have been actually very successful using these tools and demonstrated their effectiveness in stormwater, wastewater remediation, as well as in uh, natural attenuation at petroleum sites. So much of our work, as I said before, has been um, coming from the state because frankly, there has been very little work um, in this um, area or very little support in this area. And citizens of Minnesota, um, voted to have two constitutional amendments passed, and these are the amendments, and these are the funds established as a result of those constitutional amendments, which allow us actually to fund not just the research, but also the protection of our resources and to take some actions maybe earlier than some other states have been able to take because we actually have well-funded programming. Um, so the first um, little data I wanted to show you that we um, generated recently involves the metropolitan area of St. Paul and Minneapolis, where we um, first, the group uh, of collaborators from USGS and Minnesota PCA characterize uh, chemicals of emerging concern in these waters. Um, they looked at something like 350 contaminants and found out that about half were detected in the system. And study was really spatially and uh, temporally intensive. But one of the nice things um, that was incorporated in the study was also um, they looked at the effectiveness of the sand filtration systems that are fairly common in Minnesota, urban environments especially, and they found out actually that we get pretty good removal rates for some of the contaminants. And one thing I really want to point out is, you know, sometimes when we talk to people about contaminants of emerging concern, there's this... Um, um, idea that maybe we have to do something very special for these contaminants. But I can say that the thing we have been discovering is that some of the things we have been doing already are taking care of these contaminants. And that if we are just a little bit more thoughtful and we just amend existing treatment, we can actually have a really good impact. So in this particular case, iron amended sand filtration can be very helpful for removal of many contaminants, including pHs and things like that. So my contribution actually comes... Um, um, to, to deal with the frustration that our Minnesota legislators have expressed to us many times, which is, okay, you all have been measuring chemicals for years, for 15 years in Minnesota, but what does it mean, right? So one of the things that we have now uh, been doing is we are taking the chemistry occurrence data and we're taking the molecular toxicity data from these easily accessible public databases and calculating the risk quotient for those chemicals for a variety of these molecular targets. And like I said, um, what the result is actionable because we can actually prioritize the chemicals based on those hazard quotients. And here's the just a list of prioritization for the stormwater systems. What you will see is we have PAHs in our systems like fluoroanthine. We have lots of uh, fire retardants, ester-based uh, fire retardants, which actually do pose threat. And we have a good number of herbicides in those systems. Um, so the beauty of this data is that we can actually do something about it. We can prioritize um, not only the chemicals, but we can prioritize what should we be monitoring in our biological receptors? What should we be paying particular attention with when we are actually you know, conducting our usual monitoring of the water systems? Uh, we can also take these tools directly and apply water, storm water to them directly and actually test what effects we see. And here's an example of it. And I'm, you know, I don't have time to go through it. Two good news. One, um, it seems like a relatively small number of biological pathways or targets is actually activated, which is good news because maybe we don't have to you know, develop knowledge for so many targets that we thought we do. 
And second piece, um, there's a thin green line and a pink line there. And those are the differences in biological activity or toxicity of the samples before and after going through the same filtration. We do see removal of toxicity associated with pHs in particular in these systems. Um, and I'm just going to give you uh, just a one minute update on what we are doing about 6PPDQ in our state. Uh, again, this is a state funded project. Uh, there was a bit of a delay um, in start, uh, but it is funded. We are kind of moving on with it. Why are we studying 6PPDQ? Um, as you have heard, 6PPDQ is a chemical that has been in the news a lot because it is acutely toxic to some species of salmon. And truly surprisingly and shockingly acutely toxic. You know, we don't really have chemicals on the market these days or an environment that are so toxic. Um, so it really attracted a lot of attention. One of the problems with this chemical is, and that question was asked before, it's a metabolite, right? So this is not chemical that would be regulated under you know, much of the current framework we have input put into the market. And much of the research I conducted over the years with my colleague Ed Kologie, who is the person who identified 6PPDQ um, as one of the important contaminants has been on metabolites and using these bioeffects tools to actually understand and characterize these metabolites because there's a true lack of knowledge um, on what are the biological activity of the metabolites of the contaminants emerging concerning environment. Um, so I guess some of the good news, even though this chemical is acutely toxic, so our colleagues um, in Canada, University of Saskatoon, have shown that um, it's not toxic equally to all fish. So there are some species that are very sensitive and those tend to be salmonid species. So that's good news. Um, and we do have some progress in understanding what's the mechanism of action, which is very important for us, you know, to better understand why some species are not sensitive and the others are. And I'll just show you a tiny bit of data we just generated last week. Um, this is data on human cell line. Um, you may have seen, um, you know, that some people are also concerned about human exposure to 6PPDQ. And good news is that using the standard method that EPA uses to screen for these molecular targets uh, and toxicities, I can tell you it doesn't look like a bad thing in humans if it passes through liver because this particular... Um, assay includes detoxification by the liver. So we do not see the uh, classic profile that we would see, you know, um, for the mitochondrial toxicant in this assay. So while it's good news, the bad news is it's still bad for the fish species. And what we're doing is we're going to do the statewide study of the occurrence of this chemical. And we're going to work with our tribal partners um, on assessing effects on brook trout, salmon, and coho salmon, and a couple other species that are particularly important to indigenous people in our state. And also, uh, we're going to look at the other species that are uh, important to commercial fisheries and sports fisheries like walleye and other species. So with that, I end and thank you. All right. Thank you. Is there any, any quick questions before, before you walk away? I, I guess I want to clarify if I can, if there's no other questions. Oh, there is. Good. Microphone, please, Elizabeth. Hi, Elizabeth Krausel with Michael Baker International. I just wanted to say thank you so much for mentioning good news on a topic on emerging contaminants or contaminants of emerging concern. I very appreciate that. Yeah, we, we often focus on bad news, but there's some good news. Yes, so. that's great. Thank you very much. And you, again, you'll get a chance to ask more questions. And again, think about policy. Funding, emerging contaminants are right in the middle of all of these conversations. And for the last but not least, Gary Bellin from American River is going to talk about something that really isn't relevant here, right? PFAS is not very relevant to stormwater. Is that what you're going to tell us, Gary? Is that a bad setup? I'm in the wrong meeting, aren't I? <laughs> so, uh, hi, my name is Gary Bellin. I'm a uh, senior director of the Clean Water Supply Program at American Rivers. Uh, our mission is to protect pristine rivers, restore damaged rivers, and conserve clean water for people and nature. And I'm very much focused on that clean water part. And over the past 20 years, stormwater has been a big part of my job um, because we see stormwater as being a primary component to providing clean water for rivers. Um, starting off with a personal story, when I was 38, I was uh, diagnosed with prostate cancer. Um, and when I talked to my, uh, my doctor about it, I was had the dubious distinction of being one of the youngest uh, men to be diagnosed uh, with it. And I say this because as I was doing some research uh, on, as, as we started to look more at emerging contaminants, um, 
a lot of the cancers caused by uh, PFOS are uh, thyroid issue cancers, liver cancers, testicular cancer, and prostate cancer. And so while um, I went and talked to the gen my uh, gen a geneticist to talk about this, and while um, you can't necessarily pin it on, on PFOS, and genetics are certainly something that is comes into play, she said that if you look at the data over a number of years, people are starting to get cancer at younger and younger ages, and it is definitely something environmental in that factor, and you see it in the news all day. So for me, this is a very personal issue, and for a lot of people in the communities across the United States, this is becoming more and more of a personal issue, even though it is a little bit um, convoluted, complicated. I'm going to try and keep it as simple as possible. Um, thus, my slide will not have any pictures in it, um, but we'll talk about it really quickly. So what are PFOS? Um, PFOS uh, stands for per or polyfluoral alkyl substances. And what that basically means is um, if you take a chain of carbons, if you all remember organic chemistry classes, or maybe you don't, um, you have a chain of carbons, you can manipulate carbon uh, uh, atoms in multiple different ways. And you take fluorine atoms and fluorine atoms are very electron hungry and they stick to those carbon atoms really, really, really tightly. Uh, and that's what makes PFOS so durable uh, in the environment is that they don't degrade very easily because of that tight um, electronic bond. That also means that the fluorine, uh, doesn't, as soon as they grab up those carbon atoms that are attached to that carbon chain, they don't have any more room for any other atoms. So they're very repellent to other substances. And so that's what gives them their nonstick capabilities. So you see it a lot in cookware, uh, waterproof clothing, um, fire retardants, it's very heat resistant. Uh, stain resistance. Uh, so they're in uh, products across the country. They've been they were discovered in the 1940s, and so they've been used um, over time uh, in incalculable in number of places. In fact, I would imagine that everything we see around us right now, from the paints to the carpets in this room, have some form of PFOS in it. Um, there are about at this point 9,000 different uh, types of PFOS uh, out there that have been established um, for a number of different purposes. Um, last I checked, EPA said there are about 600 of them that are uh, currently in commercial use. Some of them have been phased out. Others uh, are being developed to this day. Um, and so that's why this is such an emerging issue because it's so widespread. Um, they do not degrade. So they're sometimes referred to as forever chemicals um, and they bioaccumulate, which is the issue that we're most concerned about. Um, so right now in terms of surface water, there's not a lot being talked about with PFOS. There's a lot uh, of conversation, a lot of activity around drinking water sources and how do we regulate this for drinking water, but we're not talking a lot in terms of the surface water inputs. So uh, industrial inputs, um, but also wastewater, biosolids, uh, which is a scary thing coming down the pike that we're gonna have to deal with, and, um, uh, and stormwater as well. Um, and studies have even found levels of uh, PFOS in rainwater. Um, through uh, uh, atmospheric deposition. So it's just, it's, it's everywhere. And I, it kind of reminds me a little bit about um, the stories you hear from the 1950s and 60s with lead uh, gasoline, leaded gasoline, where all of a sudden people are finding it everywhere in the world and not, not even where their cars, but because of how this stuff is being pushed out in industrial processes. Um, and, and right now the highest concentrations of PFAS you see are around industrial sites. Um, and uh, but that, um, and it varies from place to place, but we are seeing levels of PFOS in almost every freshwater fish uh, in the US. And so uh, not only are we talking about industrial and drinking water inputs, but we're now talking about people um, eating fish um, that they fish out of rivers, uh, biosolids for wet, from wastewater treatment plants being applied to fields and being uh, uptake in crops and, um, and dairy. Uh, and the impacts on wildlife right now are very, um, there's a lot more research that's needed. Uh, not very well known, but we do know, we see a lot of studies in terms of how PFOS are um, impacting rats. I even saw that they found that um, uh, in cats, uh, there was a survey of cats, uh, indoor cats, where they're finding high levels of PFOS that were resulting in thyroid issues um, in, in these pets. So clearly there are going to be impacts on wildlife and uh, biodiversity, but they're not clearly well understood yet. And there's still more research that remains. Um, and so, as I said, the regulatorily speaking, the process is still very new. It's still being talked about. In fact, it's only just this year 
that the uh, Biden administration uh, actually just last month came out with a paper on uh, a review of what PFOS, um, the impacts and the studies that are going on and where the gaps might be in research. Uh, EPA has just put out draft regulations for drinking water uh, standards. Um, but with all this contention, um, we're not looking at, for me, at least for the American rivers, that, uh, that piece of the source water um, inputs. And so there needs to be a focus on the sources of contamination there. What are we going to do about it? Um, and what are the ecosystem uh, impacts? And, and I say this not because I'm drumming up you know, a, a push for more regulation on stormwater or wastewater, but to say that the, the big focus of this is on the source uh, of the contamination. Somebody said earlier um, in one of the earlier panels about CERCLA, is CERCLA the right um, piece of regulation for this? And I would posit probably not because CERCLA really focuses on um, legacy sediments and legacy pollutants and, and where you can't identify a specific polluter, they've gone out of business and you're trying to round up the funds to address the problem. We know where these are coming from. Most of these companies that uh, make these uh, contaminants still exist and we need to make sure that we're not putting the load on um, our stormwater municipal agencies, our wastewater agencies and making sure that um, they're not loaded with another issue they have to deal with. So we need to focus on how we get rid of these um, forever chemicals out of the system in a way that is, you know, um, uh, not burdensome uh, to people that had nothing to do with it in the first place. So uh, that ends my very quick, very short uh, look on this. Um, we're very excited as a, a nonprofit to be looking at this more because I think this is going to be coming down the pike in a really huge way. It certainly is for drinking water, and we just need to pay more attention about it in the uh, the wastewater sphere. So thank you very much. Thanks, Gary. Great job. Hey, before you leave, before you leave, if it, hold on, before you leave, if there's, are there any quick clarifying questions before we open up to the, to the panel writ large? If there's not one, I did have one that it, it, unless I missed it. So, oh, okay. There you go. Okay. Excuse me. Thank you very much for that presentation. I appreciate it. Uh, PFAS is definitely everywhere. <laughs> so thanks for that. Uh, Sean Ireland with the Environmental Protection Agency in enforcement, and I can at least give you some confidence that uh, there is the PFAS roadmap, and it does intend to focus on the manufacturers, the source controls. So in conjunction with everything else you just mentioned with drinking water and with uh, Superfund. So we're getting there. <laughs> so thanks for the groundwork too. Yeah, and I didn't mean to imply that we're not doing anything, but we're at the very beginning of that road, right? I agree for that. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, now, are there any questions for any of the panelists that we have here? Looking at resilience or, oh, there we go. You got it, Steve? And again, please identify yourself so people online know who's speaking. Kim Grove with Baltimore City DPW, and this is for Noah. Um, I, I'm so excited to see all of this. And as somebody that's contributed on our ask uh, document, we had the funding for Atlas 15 for several years in a row. So I'm exci so excited it's going forward. Um, my one question for you is, um, with this effort, are you working at all with your counterparts in Canada and Mexico? I mean, this is a lot of data driven and things don't stop at a geopolitical boundary. There's a lot of good data on both sides of it. Are you, how are you working with Mexico and Canada as you're developing these data points? So even for the current No Atlas 14, the, the we are we're, we're collecting the data from Mexico and Canada uh, as we are developing the estimates and the boundaries. We really need to uh, have the data in at least one degree buffer area in those regions. So um, we are con con planning to continue for um, Atlas 15 to collect the data and develop the, the estimates that are as accurate as possible on the boundaries as well. Um, again, I just want to thank the panel very much for this presentation, especially on the emerging contaminants aspect of things. Um, I know that this is probably a lot to ask of you guys. I mean, we're dealing with researchers and others, but um, 
we've certainly got a lot of policy implications that we need to think of. And I, Gary, I think that you're striking the correct balance, in my humble opinion, that the sources of some of these contaminants should be where we're focusing our efforts versus the downstream receivers, such as wastewater treatment plants and stormwater systems. Um, I guess I would like to kind of get you all's sense or others in the room as far as where we might be going with this because we're dealing with issues where certain populations are more exposed to some of these chemicals and others. Uh, there's environmental justice implications in some of this. And I would like just to kind of get a conversation going, if not you know, with the panel here, but at least some background with the audience participants as well as the where folks may want to go with this or what do you see this, how will this affect the work of us as resource practitioners, researchers, and others going forward. I have to turn it off and on again. Sorry to refresh it. I think that might be the deal. Is that working? Out? Oh, there you go. Um, so I don't have a real good answer for you, Chris, but based because this is for me a lot of it's new, but based on the work that we've done in terms of environmental justice on flooding. Uh, and, and stormwater flooding in particular, we need to start the conversation now, and we need to be going and talking with these communities, finding them, um, and, and getting their input. And there's a lot of that happening now within the environmental justice space. There are groups that have identified this as an issue, and they're already talking and trying to take action. Um, and we have to not repeat the mistakes we've made with previous environmental justice issues where we just kind of assume we know what the solution is and we move forward without talking to these communities and bringing them into the conversation as equal partners. Uh, early on, because we can't just assume we know what they need or want. We need to go hear that from them and involve them in part of it. And not only if we don't do that, there's going to be a lot of distrust and it's going to kind of throw up problems uh, that we sh wouldn't have to deal with in the first place. So I would say, at least in the first of this, we need to be starting the conversation with them and engaging with them uh, early on in this process. Yeah, I'd like to add to that. Um, so absolutely. Um, all of those approaches. Um, one other thing we're doing in Minnesota is um, we're not just paying attention you know, to our metro area or large areas, well-resourced areas. We're trying to go to the smaller watersheds and we're actually working watershed by watershed with some of these assessments, which allows us to get understanding of um, variety of issues that our communities experience. And we have a very large urban rural divide in our communities. And in Twin Cities metro area, we also have very large um, race-driven divide. You know, um, even though we are known as a progressive state, but if you look at the environmental impact on communities, minorities, it's disproportionately high relative to um, our um, majority or white majority. And actually, we do have state data that is actively being collected uh, to do that. But uh, same as Gary said really working with the communities and the 6PPDQ project is an example of it, where we are trying to prioritize and do more intensive research in the areas um, where maybe uh, sustenance and cultural values are so tightly, you know, so closely tied to the resources uh, that are probably endangered. Um, yeah. I'll just add that this is Sean Ireland again with EPA, that the PFAS analytics tool, yeah, it was just released uh, I think maybe two months ago, shows all of those sources and all the massive collection of PFAS data. And we worked with it for quite some time, but is now released to the public just a couple months ago for finding sources and for us to be able to address them as well. So I, I had a question for Sandra. Um, I'm Randy Nieprash. I'm with NAMSA, the Minnesota City Stormwater Coalition and Stantec Consulting. Um, Local stormwater programs all over the country are really excited about Atlas 15 and really looking forward to using the products. Could you speak a bit uh, about uh, NOAA's uh, work on stakeholder engagement in developing Atlas 15, please? So on a product develop or standard development site, um, we have this kind of like a standard procedure where we go through the peer review process and share this information with the public. Um, with the NOAA Atlas 15 development, there is a NOAA data service framework initiative, and that group will 
I, there is a plan to share the information that NOAA develops with different groups uh, across the country, including the municipalities and stormwater local entities. And NOAA Atlas 14 or NOAA Atlas 15 product or a pilot product will be part of that uh, initiative. I have a question from online from John Janke from um, with Coon Creek Watershed District in Minnesota or Minneapolis, Minnesota. So the question is directed to Dr. Um, Martinovic uh, regarding. So it's the question is at the local level, is there a concern that common stormwater BMPs, ponds and infiltration basins will eventually become sources for contaminants of emerging concern? Um, thank you for that question. Yeah, that is something we talk about because the way that these filtration systems work, they retain the contaminants, right? So, and also at some point they may malfunction and or get saturated. In those cases, yeah, they might serve um, as, you know, sources, but it seems like, and we don't have a lot of data, so this is, you know, not super substantiated by science statement I'm going to make, but it seems like based on, we do have lots of data for phosphorus, you know, and uh, materials like that. It seems like that is a good kind of guiding post for us, for the other CECs as well. So again, um, you know, just using the existing knowledge of these systems with more traditional contaminants has been helpful. But yeah, it is a concern. Can I add to that, uh, Seth? Uh, so in the little bit of research that I, I've been able to do, uh, I, at least with PFOS and BMPs, they are starting to see maybe a few different types of soil additives that might absorb longer chain PFOS, um, which are less soluble. Um, and so in some cases, they might work the same way they do with other heavy metals um, in terms of at least collecting them. And you do have to remove the soil and the plants at some point. But then uh, there are, to Dr. Martinovich's um, point, there are different contaminants where we're talking about like long or short chain uh, PFOS, which are more soluble. Um, where the BMPs might actually become a source. Um, and so I think you have to, it, that's the complexity of emerging contaminants is that each one has different chemical properties and we just have to kind of figure out where we have the right BMPs for the right uh, contaminant. Okay, any other questions? Oh, Fred's got one. Yep, identify yourself, please, Fred. Just turn it on and off if it doesn't, if it doesn't come on. Just, just push the thing up. There you go. Okay, there we go. Um, Good morning, Fred Andes from Barnes and Thornburg. Uh, and I work on a lot of these issues for uh, cities and companies uh, on stormwater issues around the country. And I have a question particularly for Dr. Martinovich on 6PPDQ. Uh, you've talked about looking at different toxicity issues. And I think you started getting into this topic just now of which BMPs are more or less effective. And my sense is from some studies out in Washington state, there are some real data gaps in terms of figuring out like it's it's not necessarily like other constituents in terms of figuring out which BMPs are most effective in addressing 6PPDQ runoff and wonder you know what your thoughts are in terms of what would be if we're trying to look for solutions what kind of information what kind of studies can we do that will be most effective in getting us to a point where we can start applying the right BMPs to the right compounds yeah, I, I very much agree with your assessment. I would say it's not just 6PPDQ. Actually, if you start looking at contaminants, you know, we, like we heard, uh, if you start looking at the polar versus hydrophobic contaminants, they're going to behave very differently in these systems. Um, however, the, the little bit of work that I have seen, we are seeing uh, people amending the existing filtration systems with um, different forms of iron, sometimes um, types of iron that are nanoparticulate kind of matter that actually have really good binding capacity for a variety of compounds. And also interestingly, infectious agents, which is another thing that again, is really nice when you think about if we all collectively decide to improve these systems and actually get the research done that we need, we can improve some other issues that are correlated, right? Uh, such as um, antimicrobial resistance and things like that. But long story short, I, I honestly think we need further research, but most likely it's not gonna be BMT, BMP that is not amended with something that's specifically really good at removing those types of contaminants. And iron and various forms of iron seem to hold some promise. 
Other questions? Dave? Hi, it's Dave Smith again. I have a monitoring question. Um, can you hear me okay? Okay, good. Um, I'm hearing more and more um, states expressing interest in, in asking um, municipal stormwater programs to uh, do more monitoring for emerging contaminants. And, you know, at least, Gary, you mentioned that you know, maybe it's not realistic to expect them to be responsible for controlling some of these emerging contaminants, or at least PFAS. Um, I'm just interested in hearing your thoughts on, you know, what's reasonable to expect of municipal stormwater programs to monitor here, either to monitor for the presence of CECs or for the effectiveness of different kinds of BMPs and controlling them. That's an easy one. Um, no, I'm kidding. Uh, so, so I, I don't, I don't necessarily have a strong opinion on this yet, as I'm still doing the research on it and and what to expect. Certainly, as I've worked on stormwater over the past years, it's it's real unrealistic to kind of try and do any sort of water quality monitoring in stormwater because of the breadth of it and uh, of the different contaminants you can find in there. And I've always and maybe this is a little controversial in some spheres, seeing water volume as a, a proxy for this. And if you can reduce the volume, then you're effectively being able to address these other issues. So I, I think we should we should be doing some sort of monitoring to see where the sources of contamination are. We need to be able to kind of pin that down. But I think in terms of remediation or trying or mitigation in these cases, I think we should be trying to focus on volume uh, as a as a place to start uh, and and not have to. Uh, and use that as a proxy for our water quality issues. I, I want to comment briefly too. Um, I think it's pretty unrealistic ask at this time, given the um, cost. You know, most of the um, entities that are being asked to do that would not have on-site equipment to do that, number one. And number two, it's typically still research-grade equipment or equipment that you would see at places that will charge you a lot of money for it. And again, going back um, to the idea that some of the traditional methods and knowledge, you know, like volumes and knowing sources in the area can actually give us a lot of that information. I think it would be wonderful if it could happen in the future, but I think right now that's a big ask. Hey, Randy, while you're while you're doing that, I, I, this is again for those who don't can't see Seth Brown with uh, NAMSA executive director. I wanted to follow up real quickly before I, I can if I can hop in on on the the issue of volume and infiltration to treat. Is there a concern that this could take a surface water issue, make it a groundwater issue? Oh, hell yes. Okay, okay. I just, <laughs> okay. All right. Well said. <laughs> uh, <laughs> There's a lot more to be, we can go much further. I, I did my, my master's thesis on nutrient okay. uh, transport in groundwater from chicken farms. So yes, right. uh, that's something right. that's constantly <laughs> of giving me heartburn. Yes. But again, it, it depends on the contaminant and yes. the absorption. Yeah. yeah. Well, I guess it, I don't know if Fred if Fred left the lawyer in the room. Oh, there you go. That'll 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 give some more uh, work for the lawyers in the future. So anyway, Randy, go ahead. Um, so actually, so I'm Randy Nieprash again, or still. Um I'm it's really a follow-up on Seth's question, but it's also continuing the theme of impossible PFAS questions. Um, and I'm not gonna ask you to actually answer the the actual question. It's really who should we look to? to answer these questions. So we're seeing, we're finding everywhere we, will, we look, we're finding PFAS. Um, Gary, you mentioned it's in rainwater. Rumor is stuff in rainwater ends up in stormwater. Uh, breaking news. Pro prove it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then it runs across surfaces. So there's liable to be even more. Um, and yet the regulatory pressure everywhere in the country is to infiltrate as much of this stormwater as possible. So we need to know the fate of the PFAS in the soils immediately underneath all these SCMs. But then we also need to know, is it, what's the possibility of this infiltrated contaminated stormwater making it to groundwater in significant amounts and resulting in problems, you know, God help us after that happens. So the question isn't, is this gonna happen? It's who should we look to to answer these questions? I love these questions because I'm learning all this with you all. 
Um, so uh, this is, you know, I think traditionally when we've dealt with water quality, we look to the federal government uh, for this. And and I think there's there's still a strong role for the federal government to play, but because of the local nature uh, of these, we need to be thinking about how do we how do we empower the municipalities and stormwater agencies to to be more um, uh, I don't know what do I want to say on this? How, how do we empower them to be able to be more engaged um, to so we can do this in a way that isn't over over burdensome for them, but is is uh, but is uh, tailored in a way that meets the particular uh, contaminants uh, that they might be seeing in their area. Because like we said, there's so many of them in so many different places. So I, I don't have a good answer for you, Randy, but I think I think it needs to be a combination of that local federal um, uh, connection. Okay. I've got one last question, if I can throw one in there too. Dr. Martinovich, you, you look at the complex nature of stormwater and all the different contaminants. As we move forward as, a, as an industry, what's the best way should we do testing on one by one, all mixtures in a lab setting, in field, field testing, field monitoring? What's the best way for us to realistically, because that's something that's a big deal, at least for our organization. I, I think you kind of have to develop a tiered system, you know, uh, where maybe you go with, if you don't have money to do the detailed chemistry, you go in with a quick bioeffect screening you see whether you have a problem or not. Then you go to your problem sites, you kind of go into deeper characterization, and then you can kind of follow up and do monitoring either on a small portion of the chemicals and kind of combine it a bit with the bioeffects. The problem with bioeffects monitoring is it's based in biology, and biology is messy, right? And we all know, you know, regulators and messy data don't go well together. So that's why I say I think the tiered system is kind of really important. But I think that combination of the tools uh, can, you know, get you there faster maybe than just using one tool alone. One last question, I think. It was a bit of a follow up in that um, when you're when you're doing your monitoring and everything, or if you were seeing a large presence of some of these chemicals, are there similar, simpler uh, either field tests or chemical analysis that has a correlation? So instead of going into these um, things like a proxy, right, right. Have you started to find that? Um, I think sometimes it yeah. might be, a, yeah. Oh, so, you know, that's such a, such an important thing. And I'll be honest with you in Chicago, when we started our study in Chicago, that's exactly what we were trying to do. We were trying to see whether we can use the chemicals that are regulated as a proxy so for some of the CCs. And unfortunately, in that system, we did not see that correlation. However, that's one of the more complex systems you can work in, you know. So I think, yeah, I think that is a way to go about some of the systems. But you know, understanding what the proxy will be may be very different uh, based on the system and the complexity of the system may prevent you from using the approach, but I think it's a good idea. We could all, believe me, I've got a million questions and I'm sure you folks do too, um, but it's good to take a break sometimes, right? So first of all, I want to say thank you to this panel. And we're going to take a break for about 15 minutes, start up at 3 o'clock. So folks online, if you don't see anything happening, it's not because we're not here. It's just that we're taking a break. So thanks a lot. We'll see you in a few minutes. Oh, coffee and cookies in the lobby. All right. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Great story. I mean, not great story.
five pounds. Are you like?
All right, we should probably start bringing everything back, everyone back to their seats and maybe. Can you help out, Chris? <laughs> if folks could uh, take their seats, we need to get going now, if we can. Okay. All right. Where's my cookie? <laughs> see, look at that. See, you're so nice. And fun. No, I don't know. I didn't see what the... Exactly. Well, that's very, very generous of you. Oh, I thought you were going to... I thought you were going to go. No, you're going to... Oh, okay. Yeah, no, I'm not... No, I'm, I just figured it takes a couple of minutes to... To wrangle. I'm going to get my... Stuff. <laughs> just think yeah exactly <laughs> well welcome everyone back uh to after a break i hope you were able to enjoy some coffee refreshments um and i guess like the next the next portion of the afternoon will be um the epa panel um followed by a couple of more detailed um information regarding the ask document that WEF and namsa developed as well as like briefing for uh from WEF and NAMSA. So without further ado, I'm gonna invite our EPA panel um with Lisa Lisa Biddle. Um she is a municipal branch chief uh, in EPA's water permit division in the Office of Wastewater Management. She has been uh working on wastewater, stormwater and related uh, policy issues for almost 20 years, um, first in the private sector and then in EPA's office since 2011. Lisa is a licensed professional engineer in Virginia and holds a BS in civil engineering from Bucknell University and a master's in environmental engineering, engineering from UNC Chapel Hill. Um, um, we also have Kelly Tucker joining us today. She's a senior advisor in the EPA's office of wastewater management. In her role, Ms. Tucker serves as a bipartisan infrastructure law implementation coordinator for the Water Infrastructure Division. Um, she has nearly 20 years of experience in the Clean Water State Revolving Fund program, um, providing policy and guidance to the state programs and technical assistance uh, to EPA's regional office. Ms. Tucker is a national expert uh, on clean water SRF project eligibilities. She earned her uh, Bachelor's of Science in Environmental Science from the University of Delaware and a master's in environmental management from Duke University. And last but not least, we have Sean Ireland joining us from, he's a national stormwater enforcement lead in the EPA's Office of Enforcement and Compliance Assurance. Um, he has earned three degrees from University of Georgia as an environmental engineer and has worked as a researcher and a consultant, but for the past 18 years, he has served as a Clean Water Act Enforcement Officer and 15 years of which were spent in EPA Southeast Regional Office. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, and without further ado, I'll pass it on to you, Lisa. All right, good afternoon. Thanks for having us. Um, so today I'm going to try and highlight some resources from our stormwater program for you. Um, trying to focus on things that we've either recently replaced, re recently released, or that are coming soon. Um, I'll talk about four main areas, uh, municipal stormwater and green infrastructure resources, stormwater research, pr research priority areas, integrated planning, and funding and financing tools and programs. So first topic, 
Um, we recently launched a new website um, focused on offsite stormwater management. Um, offsite, we've heard a little bit of discussion about this today when we talk about offsite stormwater management. We are thinking about um, projects, mostly thinking about the post construction stormwater management uh, requirements that either are part of local ordinances or codes, a requirement for construction projects, sometimes they're permit requirements. And the idea of, of flexibility that when you can't manage all that stormwater on site or there's an advantage to managing it off site, um, they, sometimes there's an allowance to manage some of that stormwater um, outside of the main project area. Um, some of the benefits of this uh, can be that you get more stormwater managed because there just sometimes is a constraint on the amount of space that you have, or you can target doing that management in a area of need or a, a neighborhood that maybe isn't undergoing development or redevelopment that you want to target and get some, some better green infrastructure resources into that area. Um, so um, I wanted to flag that we have sort of a new website on this, and we've also recently put out a compendium of MS4 permit provisions. So we often put out these compendiums where we sort of highlight how permit authorities, often state permitting authorities, are, you know, integrating a, a concept into their permit requirements. And so we have a link to that here. And then um, coming soon, we'll have four case studies on um, some effective offsite stormwater management programs that municipalities have put out. Um, also, I wanted to highlight here, we recently finished updating our BMP fact sheet series. Um, that is a pretty large set of fact sheets that were rolled out originally in 2000 that support the six minimum measures of a municipal stormwater program. And so we've overhauled all of those resources and for a while they were not on our website and we're happy to share that they are back up and accessible to the public again. And so um, that was a big accomplishment this year. Um, in the next few slides, I'll highlight um, some two additional actions, a small rulemaking that we're in the middle of the process of and some stormwater outreach tools that I'm excited to tell you about. Um, so the small MS4 urbaniz urbanized area clarification, um, the Census Bureau up comes out with their um, revised uh, census data every 10 years and the 2020 census, they made several updates, which they often do. And this one of the updates they made was to their program criteria um, where they um, used to use a term called urbanized area. Uh, they're now using a broader term called urban area. And our phase two MS4 stormwater regulations keyed off of that urbanized area term. And so we are in the process of doing some discrete regulatory updates to address the fact that that term is no longer included in the, in this year, in the 2020 census. Um, so we did, here's sort of the timeline where we are in the process. We proposed that rule um, and took public comment on it. We in parallel proposed a direct final rule in the event that we didn't get any public comment, then we could kind of move forward faster on it. But we did get some public comments. So we're doing our normal um, notice and comment rulemaking process. And uh, we're in the process now of addressing public comments and preparing to finalize that rule. And we're hoping that'll come out probably in the next few months. Okay. Last September, we published a suite of communications tools uh, for permittees to use as part of their effort for their public education and involvement um, minimum control measures. Why did we do this? So we heard a lot of feedback from many stakeholders that are in the room here that there could be some uh, economies and some more efficiency for communities to implement uh, this part of the municipal stormwater permit requirements if we were to create some resources that were accessible and that could be used uh, by communities. And so we did a lot of brainstorming, we collected stakeholder input, and we've developed some materials. Um, we are currently looking for feedback on them. So I'll just give you a little tour through them. Um, the three main goal areas of, the, of these tools were to inc about increasing awareness about stormwater management, for promoting practices, and inspiring investments in our communities for stormwater controls. Um, the, the tools cover a wide range of topics that can be used for social media, web pages um, and hard copy handouts or posters. And along with these materials up on our website is a how-to guide that sort of talks users through um, how, like how they might wanna leverage these tools, give some helpful language that can be used in social media when you're um, you know, tweeting or putting out a post. Um, and um, so the first topic, increasing awareness. Um, these you know, materials are about explaining what stormwater is and how it gets polluted. There's brochures, infographics, and 
um, some social media graphics like the ones that we're showing here on the slide. Um, these materials here are about focusing on getting folks to take stormwater smart steps to protect our waterways. Um, there's some tip sheets, which I'm showing here, as well as some posters and handouts that could be used by local businesses to do their part in um, educating their community and their, um, their employees about how to make sure they're protecting our stormwater. And... Uh, and these materials are a, a set of things about educating municipal officials, elected officials, and financial institutions about the benefits of investing in green infrastructure. Um, one of the things in this set of materials is a template for a PowerPoint presentation that can be customized with your community data and plans and activities um, and you know, used to uh, present to um, municipal stakeholders and advocate for um, you know, improving stormwater management in the community, um, building more green infrastructure. And there's a, uh, several case studies on how green infrastructure has been leveraged in communities um, to more effectively manage stormwater and improve quality of life. So this is our first rollout of these materials. We're, we're hoping that you will check them out and give us some feedback. Um, we are really looking for input and we hope to continually improve them over time. So um, we're excited and thank you to Bianca for printing some because I know that there was some on the on the table when you came in so you might have gotten a card and Rachel has some hard copies too that we are we're going to just like pass and let folks flip through um, feel free to take one if you're very excited. <laughs> um, so our green infrastructure team maintains a website that contains a lot of helpful resources information on past technical assistance, links to case studies, information on overcoming the barriers to implementing green infrastructure in your community, uh, and also a lot of resources on funding and financing of green infrastructure, as well as a large set of recorded webcasts. We've been uh, doing a quarterly webcast series since 2014. Uh, here I'm highlighting for you two recent publications that we put out that are about use, about um, the value of using green infrastructure to improve resilience to flooding and climate change. And the last thing I'm highlighting here is our Green Infrastructure Federal Collaborative, which EPA relaunched about two years ago. It's a cooperative effort among over 12 federal agencies to promote green infrastructure and nature-based solutions. Um, they do, in addition to working together and collaborating, there's also some public outreach efforts including an effort to consolidate information on accessing funding sources and overcoming barriers to green infrastructure. Uh, and this year they've launched three implementation committees among the federal agencies that are involved. Um, they're focused in on coordinating technical assistance in regions across the country, building regional permitting networks with expertise in nature-based solutions and expanding training to municipal stormwater uh, floodplain and emergency managers. Moving on to topic number two. Um, here, I wanted to highlight uh, some key priority areas that we're tracking in the research arena, arena and our efforts to collaborate across the agency. So not everything up here is from our group within the Water Permits Division, but um, all really important work and very relevant to the discussion today. So I did try to pepper a lot of links into my slides and I hope that folks, I think that you, you will all receive a copy of these slides and you may find some of the resources that we're highlighting here helpful. Um, we're, we have many initiatives ongoing at the agency related to climate and environmental justice. Um, you know, we're looking for opportunities to think about that and integrate those concepts into our permitting program through our technical assistance efforts. And our Office of Research and Development's research agenda has several items on that front. And that's what I've linked to in that third link on the left there. Um, related to pollution prevention, um, we have a few things flagged here. One is within our branch, uh, we are updating our industrial fact sheet series. So uh, we have a group that works on the municipal or the multi-sector industrial uh, stormwater permit. And there's a suite of resources that are sort of like a voluntary aid for sites to use that cover a lot of pollution prevention practices. And we are currently overhauling those and trying to update them and get them back up on our website. 
Um, so that will be ongoing over the next year. So if you have, we did do a public request for input on those and did some listening sessions and we continue to work on them. So uh, open to continuing to engage on that front. Um, there's also some grants here that I've highlighted where stormwater related pollution prevention research is being pursued. Um, specifically on source control, which there's been a lot of good discussion about today. Um, I wanted to highlight several resources, um, including some promising work related to the impacts of street sweeping programs. Um, in particular, our Region 1 office has engaged in a project out of the University of New Hampshire, which drew on previous research on street sweeping from uh, uh, the Midwest. And I'm looking at Randy because he's been very, he's been following that research really closely. Um, so that project has provided recommendations about credits for street sweeping in New Hampshire. And now uh, the communities are actually piloting that and um, seeing how the latest science can inform accrediting scheme for total nitrogen and total phosphorus credits in communities as they target leaf fall in particular in their street sweeping programs. Um, Another link I included there uh, is to an integrated planning case study, and I'll talk about integrated planning next, but um, in the city of Seattle, they have done a lot of, uh, they put a lot of numbers together and research to justify really pr prioritizing street sweeping over some other infrastructure investments in their community because of the expected water quality outcomes. And there's a great deal of work as, as we've discussed today going on related to emerging contaminants. Um, some of the storm, stormwater related pollutants we're tracking, you know, PFAS, microplastics, 6 PPD, and there's work related to methods and fate and transport, ecotoxicity, as well as technologies for treatment and destruction. Okay. Moving on to topic number three, integrated planning. Integrated planning is about municipalities um, thinking more holistically along about their clean water investments. Um, thinking about stormwater projects, wastewater projects, um, sewer infrastructure, green infrastructure, and really thinking about where they can get the greatest water quality benefits sooner and sequencing projects based on that. Um, so we have a lot of resources that have been up on our website and they continue to grow. And over the last year, we've spent a, a lot of our time developing a toolkit to work with permitting authorities on um, integrated planning and really how they can engage their community. So I'll give you a little more information on that on my next si slide. But before I move on, I wanted to highlight some stormwater focused resources that we've developed also in the suite of integrated planning tools. Um, we've piloted and in informed this process uh, by working with four communities and technical assistance over several years and you know, identified four main areas to develop some additional resources to supplement what we have out there. Um, those Resources um, are focused on asset management, financing and funding, um, selecting suitable sites for stormwater and green infrastructure controls, and incorporating green infrastructure into roadway projects and overall like collaboration with departments of transportation on that. So um, rolling out a little later this year will be some worksheets, resources, and a revised guide that sort of from a stormwater perspective talks through this long-term planning concept and some of the lessons learned from our technical assistance. So the integrated planning toolkit I mentioned, uh, it has three modules to help permitting authorities connect with communities about integrated planning as an option. Um, it works them with them through the planning process and then also how to incorporate integrated planning projects into a permitting mechanism. Uh, so there's three modules in the toolkit that kind of go through those three steps. And as we roll that out, which I think will be in the next few weeks, um, we're going to be offering technical assistance along with that to support states as they try to engage more municipalities in integrated planning. So I've, on that slide, there's a link to uh, the email address for the person that you can reach out to if you know of a state or municipality that would want to engage in that technical assistance effort. Okay, topic number four. <laughs> um, Kelly uh, will be speaking next and she's from our SRF program and we'll cover a lot of SRF and exciting bill related efforts. Um, I'll just focus on some of the other things I've highlighted here. Um, one is a summary table, the master summary I have noted there. Um, the key, team's currently updating that. We'll be putting a new one up on our website soon. But what it does is it takes all these different federal funding sources that have been leveraged for green infrastructure, and it has a, a four columns that I think are very helpful, um, whether that funding 
can be used for planning and design, construction, operation and maintenance, which we've all talked about. There's a lot of, there's a limited amount of funding sources that get used for that and monitoring. Um, so it's kind of a helpful key to when you're looking to work on a certain part of your program um, and seek funding for that. Um, we also have the link to the Water Financing Clearinghouse, which is a searchable tool for funding programs. And also on that website, there's a lot of recorded learning modules that are really helpful. Um, so I wanted to put a link to, to one there on stormwater funding and financing. And I did want to acknowledge the exciting new grant program um, for the Centers of Excellence for Stormwater Infrastructure Technology. You know, this was authorized in our FY23 budget, and we are going through the internal steps of standing up a new grant program now. Um, so I did give a link to the website where when we can put more information out publicly, that's where you should, you should watch. And, um, you know, it is in the works and we're really excited about that. Um, so with that, I think I'm wrapped up and I will hand it off to Kelly. Okay. All right. So I am Kelly Tucker. I am with the Clean Water SRF program, and I work on implementation of both the Clean Water SRF and the bipartisan infrastructure law. Um, so I wanted to talk today about some of the opportunities for funding stormwater, and then also talk about some of the things that EPA is doing to encourage the SRF programs to fund more uh, green infrastructure and nature-based solutions. Um, so based on what I heard of some of the earlier discussions and what I was told before coming here today, I think you're all very familiar with the Clean Water SRF program, but I just want to give a very quick overview for anyone who needs a refresher. Um, the uh, Clean Water SRF is a low cost source of financing for a wide range of water quality and public health projects. Um, the program operates in all 50 states and Puerto Rico and the programs operate like banks. Uh, they are capitalized with grants um, that EPA makes each year. The states contribute a 20% state match, and then those funds are used to make loans for uh, water quality, uh, water infrastructure projects. Um, as those loans are repaid, funds are recycled back into the program to fund more projects. Um, so, just want to make sure that we're all on the same page with how it works. Um, the, the SRFs are primarily a loan program, but there is some ability to provide um, what we call additional subsidization in the form of grants and forgivable loans. Um, so we also just wanted to take um, a moment to talk about the roles and responsibilities in the SRF program. So it's a, a federal state partnership and EPA is, is really responsible for um, program oversight and providing uh, policy and guidance uh, for the state programs. Um, but it's really a state managed program and the states are responsible for selecting the projects that receive funding and um, for figuring out how the funds are distributed overall, how the subsidy is distributed and that sort of thing. Um, and so that's really why it's very important to, to get to know the, the SRF program within your state, um, understand their, their funding process um, and their timeline, and um, talk to them about what types of things are eligible um, to, to really help um, build, help them build that pipeline of projects, especially when it comes to stormwater. I heard some comments earlier about um, you know, maybe not the states haven't done a lot of funding for stormwater. So, so working with them to make that um, a priority within the state and to help build that pipeline, bringing the projects uh, into them um, is really important. So the bipartisan infrastructure law is the um, largest federal investment in water infrastructure. Um, $50 billion was appropriated to EPA uh, through the bipartisan infrastructure law. Um, and $43 billion um, dollars of, those, of that 50 uh, is being um, distributed through the state revolving funds, both the clean water and drinking water revolving funds. Um, so focusing here on the Clean Water SRF, uh, because um, that's the program that can fund stormwater infrastructure, um, $11.7 billion was appropriated over the next five years for Clean Water SRF eligible projects uh, to address 
wastewater and stormwater infrastructure. Additionally, $1 billion was appropriated over the next five years for clean water SRF projects to address emerging contaminants. Um, a substantial portion of, of both the, what we call the clean water SRF general supplemental funds and the clean water SRF emerging contaminants funds will be distributed as additional subsidy as a principal forgiveness um, and grants. Um, so just talking a little bit about additional subsidization, as I said, the majority of the uh, bill funding or a substantial portion of the bill funding will be distributed as um, grants and forgivable loans. Um, there's also the ability to provide additional subsidy in what we call the base SRF program, our usual program that um, is a range uh, currently between 10 and 40% of the capitalization grant. For the general supplemental, it's 49% of the capitalization grant. And for the emerging contaminants funds, all of those will be distributed um, as additional subsidy. Um, so for in the clean water SRF program, uh, additional subsidy can be provided either to municipalities that meet the state's affordability criteria, those are disadvantaged communities, um, or for particular project types. And so those project types include stormwater, energy and water efficiency, and sustainable project planning, design, and construction. And so I, I do want to mention that with the bipartisan infrastructure law, the um, agency priority is to, to get those funds to disadvantaged communities. Um, however, um, for both, both the um, bill and the base program, um, states can, and um, many do, use the additional subsidy to prioritize um, stormwater or usually green infrastructure uh, type projects. Um, so what can be funded uh, with the bill and base clean water SRF funds? Um, so the clean water SRF has 12 statutory eligibilities, um, which allow us to fund a wide range of water infrastructure and stormwater projects. And so one of those eligibilities is measures to manage, reduce, treat, or recapture stormwater. And so that is um, pretty broad. And so really essentially um, any stormwater infrastructure project that has a water quality benefit uh, would be eligible. Um, it doesn't matter if it is privately owned or if it's publicly owned, it includes both gray and green infrastructure. Um, we, are, we can fund uh, capital projects. We cannot fund operation and maintenance activities. Um, but I do wanna mention that um, with stormwater, um, generally we cannot fund uh, monitoring, but when it's in conjunction with an eligible stormwater infrastructure project, we can fund monitoring um, during the start project startup period to assess um, project effectiveness. Uh, also, we can fund planning and design where there's a reasonable expectation that it would result in a capital project. Um, and that even includes things like stormwater management plans where you're identifying uh, locations where you would be installing BMPs um, to, to address uh, stormwater issues. For the Clean Water SRF uh, Emerging Contaminants Funds, in order to be eligible for those funds, the project must meet one of the 12 uh, statutory project eligibilities. And then the project also has to address an emerging contaminant that is known to be present uh, within the watershed. And so we've had a lot of questions about what exactly that means. Um, and so we're, we're trying to be as flexible as possible um, while still funding projects that meet the intent uh, of the law. And so we're allowing for either a quantitative analysis to be done. So doing the actual, you know, taking samples, monitoring, identifying an emerging contaminant um, or a qualitative analysis. So if there's, you know, perhaps studies that have been done within the watershed, um, basically pointing to stormwater as uh, a source of this emerging contaminant um, and, and a source of the issue, um, something like that may work as well um, to, to be able to say that the project addresses the emerging contaminant. In terms of what technology needs to be installed, there 
based on the last discussion that we just had, there's there hasn't been a lot of research in that area. So if the technology shows promise to address the emerging contaminants, then that is that's okay. I, I think we don't necessarily know that something is going to be 100% effective. Um, but if the intent of the project is to is to try to address that, um, then that would be okay. I don't think I said what an emerging contaminant is, and it is different between the clean water SRF and the drinking water SRF. And so in the clean water SRF, it's projects, um, it's, I'm sorry, it's contaminants that do not have water quality criteria established under uh, section 304A of the Clean Water Act. And so that includes things like uh, PFAS, um, microplastics, uh, 6PPDQ. Um, so there's, many things that fall into that category. If you go, EPA has a website where you can look up um, which contaminants have water quality criteria established. Um, and so this is really an area where I think there is a lot of opportunity for stormwater. Um, the states are actively looking for projects to fund um, with this money, and it is all um, additional subsidy. So, you know, if you have ideas, I really encourage you to reach out uh, to the states and talk about them um, because, you know, this is different from our base clean water SRF program where, you know, perhaps the states do have a, a pretty robust pipeline. This is totally new. So it, it, it really opens the doors um, to trying new things and funding new project types. And so just one example, um, it hasn't, I don't believe the loan has been made yet, but the Washington Clean Water SRF program does um, plan to fund a, a project to address 6PPDQ um, in stormwater. Um, and then kind of revisiting uh, what I talked about earlier in terms of the roles and responsibilities, but how to apply for SRF funding. It is critical that you develop a relationship with the SRF in your state. Um, they're the ones who make the funding decisions. And again, I, I think it's just important to have those discussions with them about making stormwater a priority. Um, they're the ones who are going to incorporate it into um, their intended use plans and, and do the outreach to those types of projects. A lot of times when we talk to states about, um, hey, would you fund this type of project? Um, they, or because you haven't done it before. Usually what the response is, is that we would fund it, but no one has come to us. We, there, we don't have a demand for it in the state. So, you know, work with them, bring them projects, bring them you know, a whole pipeline um, and just make it really hard to say no. Um, and then so shifting gears a little bit, I did want to talk about um, some of the ways that EPA is encouraging states to fund green infrastructure uh, and nature-based solutions. Um, so the Green Project Reserve, this, this has been a part of the clean water SRF appropriation since the Recovery Act in 2009. It's been in subsequent appropriations um, 2010 until now uh, for the last decade or so. Uh, this requirement has, it requires the uh, clean water SRFs to um, provide a portion of their capitalization grant for green infrastructure, water and energy efficiency, or other environmentally innovative activities. Um, and so while these types of projects have always been eligible in the Clean Water SRF program, it, it really, it's just an, an added incentive um, to get the states to be funding and thinking about funding more of these projects. Um, the thing that we do here about when it comes to green infrastructure um, and non-point source type projects is that there's a number of challenges. Um, one thing is that, as I said, the Clean Water SRF is primarily a loan program. Um, and so finding a repayment source uh, for the loan is, is often a challenge. And then in terms of who is receiving the funding, there's while private entities are eligible from a national perspective, there's states that have certain uh, rules and regulations against providing financing to private entities. So the states have been really um, creative in coming up with different mechanisms for how they can reach these projects. Um, I don't have time to get into all of the different things that are listed here right now, but we do have um, a, uh, I don't know what to call it, a handbook, I guess, um, 
uh, talking about the non-traditional financing options that's linked here. So if you're interested, you can go there um, and learn a little bit more. Um, and then building on that, we have partnered with the Nonpoint Source Program at EPA, and we have provided uh, contractor support for a number of states to implement some of those mechanisms on the, the previous slide in their programs to reach more non-point source projects. Uh, one, I think, you know, of particular interest to this group was in Vermont, where we helped them to set up a sponsorship program to fund green infrastructure projects. And with the sponsorship program, what happens is that uh, the, the SRF finds utilities that are willing to take on the cost of a um, green infrastructure project along with their loan that they're taking on uh, for their the work of their utility in exchange for a reduced interest rate. And then that reduced interest rate in effect pays for the non-point source or the non-point source, in this case, the green infrastructure project. Um, so there, the utility ends up paying um, either the same or less than they would have because of that reduced interest rate um, had they not taken on the, the non-point source project. Um, and then the last thing I just want to mention is working again with the non-point source program at EPA. We've put together this best practices for financing non-point source uh, solutions. Um, and this talks about some of those different mechanisms that states use to overcome the obstacles. Um, and then also talks about um, collaborating both with the non-point source program uh, in the state and the SRF program to kind of build that pipeline of non-point source projects. And that's available on our website also uh, for anyone who's interested. Um, and that is all I have. So I will pass it along. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks all for having me here. Appreciate Seth, you inviting me. I know that you all normally hear from enforcement. Nobody don't really want to hear from me. Uh, but, you know, hopefully I can tell you the story. And then uh, Seth had suggested I tell you even some of the basics because hopefully you don't have to deal with enforcement too much. So I'll, uh, I'll jump into that for some of you more basic elements, just what is the enforcement process, who we partner with to make sure we actually implement these regulations that we're hearing about some of the numbers, a lot of people always want to hear the numbers and where are we focusing our attention so that we can ultimately level the playing field. As far as enforcement, we of course need to collect the information and be able to do something with that. And it's surprisingly hard for us to even know who's permitted. Uh, MS4 is a pretty straightforward when it comes to industrial and construction, especially we don't have a good handle on that at the federal level, frankly. But we wind up collecting the information of the permittee, the status of their compliance, monitoring results, all of these things to be able to then start to investigate, start to do the analysis of that so we can truly do targeting to be able to get the biggest bang for our buck. And what is that going to be? Where are we focusing our interest on particular sectors, some particular industry, MS4s, what it might be? Or if it's going to be an environmental interest, such as the impairments of a particular water body. And then, of course, right now, the administration is especially interested in environmental justice, so we're directing a lot of attention there as well, to ultimately decide where we're going to do inspections, where we're going to collect even more information. And what folks may not know is we're often doing inspections that you don't even know we're around, in such as reconnaissance inspections or desktop audits, uh, before we even get to the point of doing a compliance evaluation inspection or full-on audit. And then in addition to that, we can collect under Section 308 of the Clean Water Act, we can collect pretty much anything we want when it comes to discharge of pollutants to waters, such as organizational structure or even funding mechanisms or operator uh, permittee obligations, that sort of thing, or the enforcement history from states and such. That is the type of information that then allows us to make a determination of, okay, what's next? Are you in compliance or not? And in this whole stage, this is all about collecting and evaluating information. This is not a violation determination. You won't hear anybody use the V word in the field. Uh, that's only for when you get back to the office and you start to evaluate the information you've collected. 
So if there's a, an inspection report that's provided with areas of concern, letter of you know, warning letter, something that regard, that's not true enforcement. That is really more a matter of keeping you informed. We want to find a way for you to get into compliance. The notice of violation, when it comes into the EPA at least, the only one who can use the V word is the division director level. So to actually get an NOV, that means a lot. It's gone from staff to management to management through legal division director. And before we put in that level of resource, if you get an NOV from the EPA, it's a good chance you're gonna to go to the next step, which is formal enforcement. And that is actually an independently enforceable document that you can issue it through administratively, an order, administrative order, um, or, and you can do that unilaterally or through consent. Uh, unilateral, we steer clear of those most of the time, but if we have a sound administrative record, we can proceed to actually get something done and say, you must do this. Uh, consent, we prefer to do it across the table to be able to come up with a resolution together. Uh, that is the corrective element side of it, whereas if there is a penalty, which typically there is a penalty, there would be the consent agreement final order. They usually go hand in hand, but that is the penalty side. If a penalty gets up to uh, $300,000 or so, something like that, or more, then we have to refer the case to the Department of Justice. There are other circumstances where we might refer it to the Department of Justice, but that too is similar process where we try to negotiate a consent decree, a decree on consent, uh, so that we can come up with a way to get back into compliance. Headquarters doesn't really get involved until it becomes a quote, nationally significant issue. There's a memo on it that describes all the circumstances for it, but large part it's really is it a corporate entity across regions or if it's a million dollar penalty or greater and but that's we also still though do independent actions like for example with PFAS we're doing a lot of lead in the PFAS world right now I mentioned penalties a moment ago we have different policies to be able to calculate penalties if you want to scare yourself or anybody else follow that link right there and read how we calculate penalty um, the top ones are more of our comprehensive, traditional approach. The 95 clean water penalty policy, everything branches off from that. So that we have an industrial stormwater policy, which was just about mm, four years ago, I think, released to the public. We worked with it for years beforehand. Uh, we also have construction stormwater. We've recently, um, well, in more of time, closer to time, we've started to develop expedited settlement agreements. They're supposed to be faster and they are meant to be um, for smaller issues. Get into compliance more quickly. Yes, you're gonna get a ticket, but hey, you know, go back and read the full policy and you'll be grateful. Uh, the middle one there, industrial MSGP, actually that's gonna come out as a pilot uh, probably in just another month or two from now, actually. All right, so where do, we, where do we go with all of this information? What are we doing with all of this? There is a lot of work to be done out there, no shortage of permittees. And as I said earlier, we really don't have the best handle on the further you go right on this scale as to who are permitted even. Um, so we can't do it on our own. Uh, authorized states really are by far taking the heavy load of making sure they get out there and issue permits, do inspections, and do enforcement where necessary. Compliance monitoring strategy from 2014 um, lays out the inspection frequency that's anticipated. And for specific to stormwater, you can see the frequency that we ask and try to expect anyway of our states to be able to conduct their inspection frequency. So, hey, if you're a construction site, there's only a 10% chance you're gonna see a state regulator. That's just a fact. Um, and then how do we make sure that the states are doing their job? Uh, it's the other SRF, uh, State Review Framework. And that was actually developed with ECOS to be able to come up with a unify, you know, uniform uh, approach to make sure that one state's the same as the other. But as anyone who's in a municipal program knows, you're even closer to the fire than states. And, you know, we, we can't do things without you. And that was part of their effort in the EPA to be able to provide the resources, to be able to build those um, programs. 
Well, so where those resources are applied from an EPA perspective is I'm showing here in this chart. Now this is all NPDES from EPA. It's not just stormwater. I don't know why, could not tease out the stormwater data, I'm sorry. But you can definitely see where uh, COVID came in and we shifted our attention towards doing uh, desktop reviews. And like I said earlier, you may not know we're even out there, but we oftentimes are, especially in coordination with states. That's not readily quantifiable how we work with states to do things. And there is an exceptional amount of funding that's now coming in to be able to get a more uh, significant presence in the field with more inspections and such. All right, so what do we do with those inspections? Enforcement. Uh, this is stormwater specific. For whatever reason, I could tease that out for the enforcement information. And so you can see here for industrial MS4s construction, how we actually go out there and do enforcement. Yes, you can see this wane through time. Uh, actually doesn't seem to appear to have been affected by COVID, but that's just because enforcement lags behind inspections. So I would suspect this year is probably not going to be tremendously robust, but it will pick up in time. Where are we doing all of this, of course? You can see here, but where we really draw our attention is in through the time of national enforcement initiatives. Our national enforcement initiatives are three-year cycles. But while the EPA strategic plan is over this four-year cycle, and right now our particular emphasis is on the four items you see there, EJ, drinking water, PFAS, and climate change. I spent about 100% of my time on stormwater and another 100% on PFAS. So if you have any questions on that, you can ask me that too. Uh, the National Enforcement Compliance Initiatives for the first uh, beginning of the 2000s, for three, I believe it was, National Enforcement Initiative cycles, we focused on construction. That's where we went after a lot of the major home builders. I think there were now like maybe nine consent decrees with some of the national home builders, Beezer, Wheeland, some others uh, that were trying to develop a compliance monitoring strategy for the entire corporation nationally or regionally. And then also big box stores included Walmart, Home Depot. Then we shifted towards MS4s. And there's a formal process for this whole national enforcement initiative thing. Uh, we just went it out for a public notice in December and the comment period closed mar mid-March. And uh, the, well, I'll work towards that, but the MS4 has been one of those as well. So for a couple of cycles, the emphasis was on phase one to quote, assess and address all phase ones. And I came from region four where we had 40% of the nation's MS4s and it was brutal. Uh, so, and then we, in that third cycle, we included phase twos. The latest Clean Water Act initiative has really been driven mostly on wastewater, but with the title of significant non-compliance. And a lot of that has been a data cleanup, but at this point, there's only 10% of major wastewater treatment facilities that are in significant non-compliance. So going well there. And then uh, you'll notice up there what's not is construction, municipal, industry is lacking. And in fact, we haven't really talked about that very much today, but it is a very huge universe to say the least. And whether it's formal or not, nationally, I can tell you we're drawing a lot of attention towards industrial stormwater, particularly at non-filers, people who fail to have a permit. Um, all of these facilities you see here did not have a stormwater permit and they are discharging nasty stuff from their site. That's pretty obvious. And it's not just a few, and it's definitely not just mom and pops. Um, through a targeting tool we've developed fairly recently, which is still EPA only, uh, and I don't see it getting released anytime soon, honestly, we've been able to find 900,000 potential targets, which we then have to filter through and through statistical evaluation, I can tell you there's about 70,000 facilities that lack industrial stormwater permits. And this is a snapshot of that tool. And the four we so far to date, we have 497 quote high priority facilities, which examples you saw on that prior slide. We've got a lot of work to do and it's, uh, we're trying to figure out how we're gonna do that. 
And as I said a minute ago, it's not just the mom and pops. Um, we had a corporate entity actually come in and self-disclose to us just recently. Uh, well, it actually they self-disclosed longer ago than I'd like to admit, but they had over half of their facilities lacked industrial stormwater permit coverage or NECs, no exposure certification. Uh, we just last month lodged a consent decree with them, half a million dollar penalty, and we actually went super nice on them because they did do self-disclosure. They couldn't qualify for the audit policy for timing reasons. Um, so, you know, my primary purpose, the way I see things is not so much to go after, um, you know, just the bad guy and I'm the cop and all of that, but it's, I see my role very much in supporting the people who are doing it right, because I want to find the worst of the worst so that I can make sure I support the people who are doing what's right, which frankly is most of you. So I assume all of you, but we'll see. And that's all I have. Just wanted to give another thanks to the panel for joining us and we're just have some time for Q and A. So uh, we're gonna. If... Um, hi, uh, thanks everybody. I'm, I'm Jonathan Champion. I'm with the DC Department of Energy and Environment. Um, part of my job is to work with our, uh, uh, the DC's SRF program. So um, Kelly, I think this is really for you. Um, Started out as a question, but I, I actually think you um, addressed it in your slides. And so I mostly just wanted to try to confirm um, that I'm understanding correctly. Uh, the So would like monitoring or sampling projects be an eligible use of uh, the emerging contaminant funds that the DIL is directing towards uh, or via the SRF programs? Uh, ooh, there we go. Sorry. Um, so it's a complicated answer. And I will say for DC, it is a little bit different because the the rules about the DC program are different from the, the states and um, Puerto Rico. Um, for the, the SRF, what we have said is that monitoring that is integral to the planning and design of a capital project is eligible. Um, so it really does need to be tied directly. You have to, it really has to be a situation where you've already identified and know that the emerging contaminant is present. And then it's more about figuring out what technology or um, the location of the technology in in the system. This is a more, it's been discussed a little bit more when we're talking about wastewater utilities. Um, so, so monitoring to to figure out where to install the technology in the system, um, or that sort of thing. It, it's possible that you would know that the emerging contaminant is there. Then you do um, monitoring, and you end up with a no action alternative. Um, so we have we have acknowledged that that is a possibility because it may be more cost effective to. Um, do source reduction or something instead, and that wouldn't be an SRF project. Um, so it's complicated, but yes, there is some possibility to do some amount of monitoring, yeah. Really helpful, thank you. Um, this is Chris French with Hydro International. I wanna follow up on that a little bit. Um, with the emerging contaminants issue, we're still learning as a sector how to monitor some of these contaminants. And this is why I think that the monitoring issue is so critical is that we're being asked through the SRF program to install BMPs that may or may not actually do the purpose that, they're, that it's designed to do. And yet we don't really have effective standards for some of these uh, contaminants like microplastics. There's a group within ASTM right now that's talking about developing a microplastic monitoring standard for stormwater. But when you've got microplastics passing through wastewater treatment plants, my question is, is that where we should be putting our attention at right now? Should we have something else a little bit more uniform first before we're actually trying to treat for these things without really knowing if we're going to accomplish the goal? And so I'm conflicted because I want to do good work, but at the same time, I'm concerned that we might be focusing on the wrong objectives here. So... 
how can we move past that within the constraints of your programs? Yeah, so that's a good question. And that's something that's definitely, you know, it's it's something that I've been working on a lot, you know, since the since Bill passed and we knew we had to to get this funding out. Um, there's a lot of questions about the emerging contaminants funds. You know, on the drinking water side, there's been a lot more research um, and they they know a little bit better um, where projects or where infrastructure is needed to address them. Um, and it's not so much on the wastewater and stormwater side. Um, so obviously there are constraints about monitoring in the clean water SRF. But one of the things that actually I spoke last week with the um, Association of Public Health Lab Laboratories. And so one of the things that we can fund in the clean water SRF is monitoring equipment. And so for stormwater, there really, there, there aren't that many restrictions on who is eligible for these funds. And so if we're talking about monitoring for stormwater, it's possible that an SRF could lend to a state-run laboratory to either, if, if you're talking about microplastics, um, to construct a clean room, um, or if we're talking about PFAS, to, to purchase the equipment to monitor for PFAS, um, as long as you have some evidence from, from studies or perhaps you know, some, some other monitoring that has been done um, to, to indicate that there are contaminants in the watershed. So there's some things that we can do on the clean water side, and we're trying to be um, as flexible as we possibly can. Um, but, but as you said, there are, there are constraints on the program. It, it's primarily a, a, a program for capital, uh, wastewater and stormwater infrastructure. And we just, we don't have a ton of flexibility when it comes to monitoring. Um, the other thing I will mention though, is that with the clean water SRF, um, a portion of the funding comes off the top before the funds are appropriated to the states um, for water quality planning grants. Um, and those funds go to the states um, and those funds could be used for monitoring for um, emerging contaminants as well. At least. Okay. A question for Lisa. My name is Fernando Pasquel. I'm with Arcadas. You had a great slide on uh, the Stormwater Smart program. And one of those dealt with one of the blocks was on increased awareness. Who is the audience, target audience for that, um, for those efforts? And do you have any materials specifically focused on elected officials? it okay <laughs> yes and yes um so the to the first question the increased awareness has a pretty broad audience but a lot of it is for the municipality to increase awareness within the community whether that's commercial businesses or citizens car washes all of that but the third slide i had about uh encouraging investment something along those lines uh is really focused on reaching your elected officials and funding funding audiences, that sort of thing. And so there, I talked about a PowerPoint that sort of is customizable, but there's uh, other materials too, handouts and so on that could be used to try and really communicate the value of investing in stormwater in the community. Hi, uh, Fred Andes, a uh, question for Kelly really, and it's often, I guess is partly a comment um, and a, something for everybody to think about. You mentioned the disadvantaged communities and the um, opportunities for, for grants or principal forgiveness that a certain amount of the money has to be spent that way. The agency guidance indicates the agency can't tell states what, it's, what their criteria should be for disadvantaged, but you have some very helpful recommendations for them, which address some of the problems we've seen where some states have current rules that, for example, one state, no town with a population above 25,000 is eligible at all to be, no matter how disadvantaged they are, which doesn't make a lot of sense. And a lot of them pre are premised on the median household income, meaning pockets of poverty in the community are ignored. So we're out talking to states and suggesting they do revise their rules, which Thankfully, EPA is recommending they revise their rules to address these issues, but it's something I think the municipal community wants to keep working with you all in terms of how can we share information 
and talk about different states are doing different things to try to focus on those issues and make sure, like when we've talked to Congress people, and we've said, so you realize no money of the grants are going to towns above 25,000 in Illinois? And they're like, what? That money that we voted, the billions of dollars and nothing goes to towns above 25,000 in the state of Illinois, that, that can't be. And we've said, well, we're working to change that, but I think we need to keep working with the agency to help states think through these issues and get the money where it needs to go. Yeah, yeah, I will, um, I will say that we have looked, well, had a lot of conversations with the states. We've looked at their intended use plans and there are a lot of states who are taking another look at their disadvantaged community definition for the drinking water SRF and their affordability criteria for the clean water SRF. Um, and what I've found is a number of them are looking at how do they reach those pockets within larger uh, municipalities, larger cities. Um, the thing, one of the interesting things about the Clean Water SRF, so we have what's called affordability criteria. It In the Clean Water Act, it specifies it has to include income, unemployment data, and population trends, as well as other factors that the state would want to include. Um, but there's this other piece of that in terms of how the subsidy can be distributed. And so it's for communities who meet that affordability criteria, but then also in some cases in this, it, it, it may apply um, for stormwater. Usually we think about it um, more for just wastewater utilities, but um, it's looking at where the community does not meet the affordability criteria um, if they're if the subsidy is being targeted to specific rate payers that would be um, negatively impacted by the increase in rates necessary to pay for the project, then that community would be eligible. Also, we have not had states utilize that authority, um, and I think a lot of the challenge with that is when it comes to uh, wastewater rate setting, you can't charge different rates to different uh, people. But that's one of the things we've been really interested in exploring. Um, so, you know, I'm happy to talk with anybody. You can email me and, and follow up, um, but talk about how that could be implemented in the program. Um, we've, you know, I, there's been interest, but, but no one's been able to figure out quite how to do it. So if anyone has good ideas, I'd like to hear it. Um, but yeah, it is important to work with your states where you see that, you know, maybe the, the, the disadvantaged community definition or the, the affordability criteria that they're using is limited. Um, it, work with them. I mean, EPA cannot tell the states what to do. We can just encourage them um, and provide information. Uh, I've, I have a question for Sean. Um, we've, I think, speaking for everybody, we've particularly enjoyed the moments when you've been funny in your comments and presentation not something we really expect from the enforcement side. Um, and every time it's been insightful. So it leads me to this question. Um, about a third of the way through, you had a slide uh, where you talked about municipal construction and industrial stormwater. And you had a little graphic for each of the three. And your graphic for the MS4 side was a hamster on a wheel. And therefore, my question is, why did you select that graphic for MS4 stormwater? I'm, I'm glad you noticed. And uh, yeah, that was uh, Windows understanding the toils that all these municipalities have to work with. You say that. So Kim Grove, Baltimore City, not as funny. Um, I, I really appreciate the efforts that EPA is taking to try and consolidate all of the funding opportunities. Um, and with the, the recent legislation that's happened at the federal level, it does feel like there's a lot of money coming to disadvantaged communities. However, I haven't seen the roadmap of where there's potential conflicts. I know a lot of those funding opportunities, if you get something from FEMA, you can't exactly use it towards other things. And has there been any thought on or um, effort within EPA to look at the other federal agencies that may be having funding related to water and or pollution that 
we can just kind of map out where there may be conflicts or um, overlaps that could be helpful, especially if you're a smaller community. Start, and, and I don't know that that's not, so I will say first that I work on the, on the Clean Water SRF and not on the other um, funding programs. Um, the Water Finance Center, uh, there is the Water Finance Clearinghouse and that does talk about the different funding sources for wastewater and stormwater infrastructure. I don't know that that gets into really looking at where there may be possible conflicts. I will say though, for the Clean Water SRF, because it is not just federal funds, because there is such a large amount of, of the recycled funds in the program, that we often don't have issues with conflicting with other federal sources of funding. Um, so usually, I don't think it, it usually doesn't matter as long as it's not being, like federal can't match federal. You can't match federal grant with federal grant. Um, so, but the SRF can be used as match for other federal funding sources because of the recycled funds in the program. Um, and we do, we've worked pretty closely with USDA and with um, FEMA. Um, we have a, an MOU with FEMA. I don't think we have an MOU with USDA, um, but talking about how the SRF can be used um, as match for, for those programs. Um, we also work with our non-point source program, um, trying to share information about how the SRF can be used as match for um, non-point source grants as well. Um, but I don't know that it's been contemplated you know, beyond those efforts um, that we have within the SRF program, but it is something we could uh, bring back to the Water Finance Center to see if it's something that they could could take on and maybe incorporate into the Water Finance Clearinghouse. Yeah, I was thinking, I, I know that there are some examples, I'm looking at Robin, who's our Green Infrastructure and Integrated Planning Coordinator in the back, and she's pulled together a lot of the funding resources I highlighted. And I know the concept of stacking funding is something that, you know, I, like we may have highlighted in some case studies, but I don't know that we have like a guide on that. So I think that's really helpful input. Thank you. The EPA panel for joining us and for the time here, so. <laughs> like it or not. <laughs> well, um, okay. So now we're going to spend a few minutes um, to. Come on, not, not, okay. You're not hearing me so well. All right. No. So now we're going to spend a few minutes going over the uh, WEF NAMSA stormwater policy recommendations document that we've put together again this year. We've done this for, since I think 2016 was the first iteration of it. We've been doing it a long time. So I'm, and I could proudly say that um, we've had a lot of successes with this document. Um, we've, uh, a lot of things that were in the document have made it through Congress and into policy uh, in one way or another. Um, so it, we kind of um, value the input that we get from our members in, in putting this document together. It's not just kind of us cooking up some ideas at uh, Galactic Headquarters of WEF and NAMSA. It's, it's actually uh, our members uh, participating in that process and seeing what's going on in their communities and in their, uh, in their, in, in their areas of the country um, and helping us to, to craft something that helps to um, address some of the challenges in municipal stormwater. Um, so uh, let's take a few minutes to pick through some of those things uh, that are in this year's document. We always try to keep it to four core things that uh, allows us to be able to kind of target our requests for Congress um, and, and, and see some headway in each of those areas as we proceed through the years. Um, you know, they kind of repeat each other a lot. Sometimes we had success with some of them and they just kind of stick around because we just had to keep advancing them. Um, 
So I'll I'll take some time to go through some of those. Um, we we want to keep on schedule too because uh, WEF is in a in an organization made up of engineers, and I learned a long time ago you try to keep on schedule with engineers, all, except for Seth. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> but but um, so I, I'm going to go quick quick on a few of these things, but I'll take some time to answer some questions. I also want to maybe toss the ball to some of the folks who were part of the planning group. Uh, and putting some of these things together to kind of elaborate a little bit on some of the details as we go along. Um, so on, on item number one, advanced stormwater provisions in the infrastructure investment and from the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Um, so, you know, the FY24 budget process is underway. The president's uh, uh, proposal to Congress to, for FY24 went in a couple months ago. Uh, it, it included um, full funding for a, a lot of this stuff that, from the IIJA, not only the stormwater stuff, but other things as well. Um, and we want to make sure that as Congress is putting together the, the FY24 appropriations bills, that they they know what those things are in the in the president's budget proposal um, and, and value what, you know, we are asking for in the stormwater space. Um, you know, we spoke about earlier the centers of excellence. That was a, a big win for uh, organizations in the IIJA. Um, that also included another provision with it uh, within it um, that allowed that provided created a new program for uh, community planning and implementation grants. Uh, in the FY23 uh, budget that passed uh, back in December, uh, the centers of excellence got their initial three million dollars in funding. They're authorized for five million, but they got three million dollars. As we heard from Lisa earlier, they're now going through the process of uh, creating that new grant program for centers of excellence. But um, for FY24, we want full funding, the $5 million amount, as well as the $10 million for those uh, planning and, and implementation grants. Um, also, the sewer overflow and stormwater reuse municipal grant program was created a number of years back as well. It's been getting consistent funding, not the fully authorized levels. Um, we would obviously love to see it get the fully authorized levels of $280 million, but it got $50 million in FY23. Like to see it increase in that amount. We, we have been getting good, strong support for that program from within Congress. Those are grants to go to helping communities with uh, stormwater infrastructure investments, as well as CSO and SSO infrastructure investments. But um, obviously, we want to see it as much as possible going into the stormwater space um, in this case. Um, so th those are kind of the three core ones um, I would like to, you know, point out, you know, we also obviously continue to support full funding for the SRF program, WIFIA program, the alternative source water pilot programs, important, the circuit and small and medium size, P size POTW circuit rider new program, uh, because that actually calls out stormwater management as a, as a um, thing that the circuit riders are supposed to uh, help communities do in those for those small and medium size POTWs. Um, so that's, um, I think those are the core parts of the FY24 budget request for Congress. I'll pause there for any quick questions we have on that before we move to the next one. Okay, thank you. And I should have said earlier that, um, you know, this is the intention of this document is for folks to go to Capitol Hill and talk to them, but it's also, um, it's the intention is to communicate uh, with within not if you don't go to the Capitol Hill to communicate with your members of Congress when you have the opportunity you know if you set up a, a virtual meeting from back home or if you have an opportunity to corner them when they're back in the district talk to them a little bit about these things um, we want you to take this with you and and utilize it um, and we, like like was said we have lots of copies of this uh, out front there for those of you who are online uh, and and hearing me talk about it the link there is on the on the um, the uh, slide to uh, where to find it on the wef.org slash water week uh, page. If you scroll down about halfway, there's a link to this document there. Um, so next up, uh, st support stormwater infrastructure funding tools. Now, this is kind of an interesting one because this kind of came about over many, many years. We kind of slowly got to the point where we're we're asking for something that's sort of like a construction grants program for, for stormwater infrastructure that would eventually evolve into a stormwater SRF program. Um, where we got, how we got here was that, um, you know, a number of years back, we were kicking around how to get more funding into the program. And there was a need for, need 
for showing the a demonstration of of more infrastructure for I mean more funding for stormwater uh, need. Um, we got money for the um, the clean water needs survey through the appropriations process. Um, we also got in that through that process uh, um, language and funding for a the EPA Environmental Finance Board to do a, an analysis on stormwater funding needs across the country, uh, and this put together a set of recommendations um, that uh, the EPA uh, Environmental Finance Board. Um, put together this great report. Um, actually, Fernando Pasquale was one of the members of the EFAB. Thank you for your time there, Fernando, and putting the, you know, a good word in for the, this uh, uh, need for stormwater funding. Um, we also had the WEF uh, chair of the government, government Affairs Committee was on it as well, a guy named Rudy Chow. Um, and that report came out, it came up with a whole bunch of recommendations, including something like a dedicated funding source for stormwater infrastructure that was sort of like a construction grants program and a, and a SRF eventually. Um, and now we have continued that message, taking that document and working it into our requests here for for the future. Um, we do seem to have some support in, on Capitol Hill for it as well. Um, another one of the uh, requests uh, from that document was um, revise the, the uh, Clean Water Section 319 program to allow for MS4 permittees um, to create a separate you know, stormwater sub program within the uh, 319 program so that more money could go through the 319 program to help uh, stormwater projects at a, at a like at least a phase two level. Um, so that's another part of this request here. Uh, any questions on on that? Okay, I'm going long. Uh, so so uh, next up is a, a federal response to intense storm uh, rain rainstorms and localized flooding. You know, Seth and Randy, maybe I could toss it to you guys since you guys were the ones that shepherded this one along. I mean, it's it's really a, about um, all the agencies kind of coordinating better on how to help communities uh, with rainstorm events, um, creating a grant program to help local communities and utilize uh, development of full system computer models, H&H &H models, uh, for, storm, for their stormwater systems and real-time storm uh, rainfall tracking and forecasting platforms. Um, this is uh, this is a new one. We haven't requested this before, but since we were successful with the Atlas 14 and 15 um, program, this that was in this document previously, and we were successful in seeing it getting some funding moving forward. This is kind of the next phase of that. I think is to help with those helping at a local level to, to do M H and H models, uh, helping them to address their challenges. Anything else on that? Okay. Good. Um, and then um, on the last one, um, so we've heard, we talked a lot about uh, emerging contaminants today, PFAS, 6PPDQ, um, you know, microplastics, things uh, like trash uh, as well. Um, you know, you know, those are entering our water environment um, from a source. Um, and there hasn't been, I mean, there's a recognition within EPA and our federal policy that we need to do more on source control. We would think if uh, Congress could show it more, demonstrate uh, a dedicated assistance to help federal agencies, EPA in particular, to, to go after the source control, address a better, stronger source control program to removing these things before they get into our stormwater environment, uh, that would be a, a, an important thing to, for Congress to show support on. So that's why this is in here. This has been in here for a few years now, um, and we just want to continue to carry that message to Congress that they need to give more dedicated resources to federal agencies to do better on source control, give them the more resources to do better on source control. Um, so uh, any additional items on that, guys? No? Okay. So uh, any questions on all of these things? Good. All right. Thank you, guys. I'm going to pass it over to who's next? Bianca's next. All right. Thanks, guys. Um, all right, well, as you've heard earlier, uh, Scott Taylor, our uh, Stormwater Institute uh, Advisory Committee Chair, 
was not able to join us today, who was going to be presenting about a couple of the activities that the Stormwater Institute has going on within WEF. Um, so I'm going to be seven in the and for him. Uh, but one of the things that WEF has been aiming at doing is um, just elevating the stormwater, right? Um, and just like recognizing those municipalities that are going above and beyond um, the, the MS4 requirements. And so if you are not familiar, uh, the Stormwater Institute, um, along with a grant uh, with EPA developed this MS4 awards, uh, which is the National Municipal Stormwater and Green Infrastructure Awards Program. So basically, uh, again, showcasing and high performing MS4 programs, the goal is uh, to be able to, um, I guess, provide a platform for learning exchanging. So one of the things that this program does is there's two pieces to it. One is that we recognize phase ones and phase twos independently, and we recognize the overall program, how the program management is being set up and an in, 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 in innovation aspect of their um, program management, again, with the goal of kind of encouraging municipalities to go above and beyond the um, encouraging them and just also, yeah, encouraging them to go above and beyond meeting requirements and like acknowledging that effort that they have. Um, and with that, um, I guess is an important uh, public relations tool for, for the municipalities itself, as well as like helps learning exchange what technologies they're using, what innovations that could be used in one location versus another, you know? Um, so these awards, um, last, last year's awards, uh, we got the winners of phase one were in Arundel County um, from Maryland. We had in program management, we had the city of Colorado Springs. Um, and in innovation, we were able to recognize and Aaron Mill as well. And again, the goal is to see what each of these municipalities are doing, but not only applicable to their location, but also how can they be applied elsewhere. And so on phase two, uh, we had the overall winner was city of Frisco from Texas. Um, on program management aspect, we got the St. Louis MS4 Oprah Mt Group uh, from Missouri, and in innovation, we got the city of Richmond, Virginia, that won last year. And the ceremony typically happens at WEFTEC. So one of the things that we wanted to let you all know is that 2023 application is now open. So um, for these awards, so if you, it opens today um, and it closes in June 5th. Um, and the the winner notification is going to be in August 1st, and we're going to be recognizing folks again at uh, WEFTEC this year and WEFTEC this year is going to be in Chicago, Illinois. So between September 30th and October 4th. So um, if you are an MS4 permit holder, phase one, phase two, um, please feel free to scan that QR code. And if you're looking to, you know, um, or if you know of an, an outstanding MS4 permittee uh, group, and please feel free to share this information with them. Um, with that said, another of the big items that the storm, the WEF Stormwater Institute works on is the needs assessment survey. So uh, if you're not aware, WEF has this, has developed this um, needs assessment survey to kind of evaluate what are the drivers, the challenges, and the needs of the stormwater sector, uh, specifically on the MS4 uh, aspect. And so this was started in 2018. It happens biannually, and um, we started uh, uh, the collection of data uh, from folks last year, and we've partnered with Seth, Seth Brown, um, who's been helping us do the analysis, and so we're going to be sharing some preliminary results um, on the data that was collected in 2022, and Seth is going to be, so I'm going to hand it over to you, Seth. Yep. All right. So we're almost done here. And uh, just keep in mind that I know that standing between a room full of people and the, the Dubliner, which is like a block away, right? So if anyone wants to go when we're done here to, to, to join us there to just uh, socialize, um, let us, you know, just come on and join us. So I'll be quick is my point. Um, okay, but, I, but I'm not Scott Taylor, as, as, uh, as you heard. So I do want to provide some uh, snapshot of what we've uh, what we found in this year's MS4 survey. So um, a needs assessment survey. And this is 
again, if you want to talk about like things that have impacts on the sector, I mean, again, what, what Steve just went over, Steve Dye, I don't even know if you introduced yourself, Steve Dye, legislative director at WEF, Bianca Pinto at WEF, and then Lisa Deason, I just want to make sure that she's also coming in as the WEF stormwater lead, just so everyone knows who who's who. But this has been a, a, a very impactful tool. We've got a lot of great legislation enacted, which is awesome. But this, um, you know, this effort, these needs assessments, we've, we've done these in 2018, 2020, now 2022. And uh, again, a lot of people in the room have been part of this over the years. So um, this has been really an impactful thing. I just want to go through what we've found preliminarily, and we're going to release the full document in June, right, at the, the Stormwater Summit at um, late June in Kansas City. So anyway, just so uh, we know the context here, there's a lot of, lot of numbers up here. I'm not going to go through all of this. You guys can read through all the, the data once it comes out. Um, but I just want to highlight a couple of, of things that I think are of, of note. The first thing is that we had over um, 640 respondents, and that's a little bit less than what we had in 2020, but it's more than what we had in 2018. So we're in the ballpark of you know, where we've been. And if you think about it in the context of um, percentage-wise, this is 7,500 or so plus or minus uh, MS4s out there. This is 8 to 10% for response rate. That's reasonable. And that's something that you find in in you know other similar efforts. So just an FYI on that, the just distribution that we have mostly phase twos. That, that's what the actual distribution of uh, this isn't exactly, but obviously we have more phase twos than phase ones. Um, so so we're getting a good sampling. Um, I don't have the information here about the different geographies, but again, we've got a pretty good representation across the country uh, about uh, of MS fours in our response uh, areas. Um, we also have we have identified that most uh, those that, that provide responses are that are that hold MS4 permits are actually work are located in a public works department or and then or a stormwater utility. Again, that's that's not that surprising, but that means that forty that 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 we've got forty percent that are outside of of that. The point is that the stormwater sector is fragmented. Stormwater departments are all over the place. Sometimes they're in a wastewater utility. Sometimes they're in a combined utility flood control district. It's challenging is the point here. So, so, but anyway, but we found that most are in, are in a public works department. So again, I'm not going to go through all the details and all the stuff that that's, that would be, that would be going over too much of the good stuff. So um, we, we ask about the top challenges. This is really a big part of why we do this. What are the big challenges? Uh, what are the drivers? So on, on the challenges side, we see aging infrastructure rising to the top. And we've heard about this asset management, aging infrastructure, not that surprising, right? And is that what you're talking about, Kim? Yeah, yeah. So, um, but this just keeps on getting reinforced every single survey that we have. And, and actually it's been rising um, each time we've done this. Funding needs are always a big challenge. That's that's why we've had two or three of our, <laughs> our identified documented or um, uh, recommendations here are on funding um, and, and funding needs. But for the first time in the top three, we've got workforce and staffing needs. Maybe that's a reflection of the workforce, you know, that uh, the folks are retiring. Um, we've got the, the aging workforce issue, um, or maybe we're just, you know, historically low unemployment, and that makes it challenging too. So anyway, that's those, those are interesting takeaways. Um, regulations are relatively low challenge. I wouldn't say that with Sean in the room. Oh, Sean is in the room. So I, I'm sorry. Um, but it's... You know, because it's just, you know, what is it? Was it is a laws without enforcement is like a is like what was it? Well intended suggestion. Well, maybe we could just change it from regulation to suggestions then in the future. But anyway, the point is um, that that we have other uh, higher challenges that are that are out there. So um, that's a bit of a surprising thing. So as far as drivers or motivators in MS4 programs, water quality is the top driver. That's not at all surprising. It's the way it should be, I would think, because it's a water quality permitting program. But again, we see aging infrastructure as a driver, right? We see a trend here. Um, and this is something that, uh, again, has been changing over the years with enough, enough of these surveys. Um, and land development is a driver. That makes sense, too. And that's historically been the case because that's what drives a lot of uh, what's been going on in these programs. But what is somewhat surprising is that pluvial or localized flooding was a moderate driver. And again, it's, you know, for a water quality permitting program, I guess that's not that surprising, but I kind of expected it would be higher, um, frankly. So anyway, um, that's, what we, that's what we found. 
We also ask about information needs. So what, what do MS4 uh, program managers need in terms of technical information and resources and products? And not surprisingly, they need information on funding and financing consistently, right? And so this tells us as organizations, what, what products should we focus on developing? And as consultants, it's good to know that too. So I think the, the, the ecosystem wants to know this. And of course, funding financing at the top, this is the way it's been the last, I think the last two um, surveys. Asset management as a need, not surprising. We have aging infrastructure. Uh, so we're seeing trends here. And green infrastructure is still uh, one of those practices that are, you know, it's relatively, um, you know, emerging or innovative compared to all the gray infrastructure that's out there. So, and then when we look at minimum control measures, the more, you know, the, the, the big one that needs more of the needs is post-construction um, uh, programs. That's not surprising. That's a big part of most stem, uh, stormwater programs, but we see consistently monitoring and evaluation as, as a high area of technical needs, because um, monitoring and evaluation is not easy, right? It takes a lot of technical resources and understanding to, uh, to address that, so. Okay, so on, on the characteristics of, of some of these programs, um, most use watershed-based um, uh, planning, which, is, which makes sense, um, and that goes hand in hand with most have TMDL requirements in their MPDS permit. Not surprising there. So this has again been consistent between the the or across all three surveys. But what's um, even more, I think, telling is that we have a lack of consensus on asset management planning, meaning that you know forty five percent of uh, MS four said that they do they do not have uh, they've not done asset management planning. With another eleven percent saying they're not sure that's the case. So that's that's a serious need. Clearly, especially when we have an aging infrastructure um, uh, sector going on. So for the first time, uh, we asked about resilience specifically because it's a rising topic. And uh, this is this is really telling, I think, um, especially considering, Sandra, the work that, that there, or the information you shared today as an example. Over 90% of communities said that they have not prepared a resilience plan. That's, that's, pretty, that's pretty startling. Um, and only... 20% uh, said they're planning on doing so in the future. So there's cl clearly a need here. <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's a gap of, uh, you know, technical investment that's, that's being made or programmatic investment. Um, and, and, and nearly three quarters said they have not updated design standards. So how do you plan for something if you've not looked at the technical aspects of, do I have to upsize my pipes? How do I change, um, you know, the size and criteria for my facilities and whatnot? So that's that's a, a significant finding. Uh, we asked about what aspects for those who have updated um, design standards, which aspect? And you know, frankly, the biggest is hard to see up here probably, but the biggest um, was other, the biggest category that was other. So there's a lot of different, and then we have got all these other things that are you know, rainfall depths, IDF curves, storm durations. None of them like stood out. So it tells me there's a lot of different things going on in terms of which area. Obviously, some of these are related. So I mean, they're not independently. Uh, looked at, but I think there's need. There, there's more work that needs to be done here. Clearly, is the point. And I think what's going beyond this, it, we've looked at what has been done and what's being planned, and what's what's limiting planning and, and going forward for uh, resilience is the number one um, factor for that was a lack of funding for resilience planning. So again, you see a, a consistent theme um, here. So we also asked about the least and most well-developed and least developed uh, aspects of the program. These are not surprising. The well-developed aspects of the program are, are those parts of the program that are just more mature, construction inspection, and IDDE, uh, public engagement. These are well understood, more well understood um, aspects of, of programs. And least developed are those that are more innovative. So green infrastructure, low impact development, Funding and financing, obviously, even where there's more information needs, obviously, it's less well-developed or less understood and less well-developed. And again, asset management, we see this, this popping up in various aspects and various uh, contexts. We asked about innovation. So this is not just what's the most innovative part of your program, but that you've seen and observed in other programs as well. Again, there was no clear um, uh, answers that stood out or categories that stood out. It, it was it was what you would think. Green infrastructure still seen as an innovative element. Mapping, 
you know, uh, using GIS, technological advancements and, and technology implementation. It's interesting that the incentives and offsets and trading um, is, was, was up there as well, uh, looking also specifically at private properties. I know that's a rising issue with a lot of um, uh, communities as well. Um, we also finally at the point where we can look at, because we've had three of these uh, surveys done over six years, now we can start to look at comparisons and trends and whatnot. And again, we're seeing if you look at if you kind of zoom way out. And again, I'm, I'm I'm channeling Scott Taylor here. Hopefully, he's if he's online, he's not cringing too much. But I'm trying to channel Scott Taylor as much as I can. But um, taking that ten thousand foot uh, level view of things, aging infrastructure keeps on coming to the top. In fact, it's been the top challenge even more so than funding and financing or funding needs and available availability of capital. So that is very telling as our uh, program, as the MS4 program gets older in age. And you think about the, the first or the initial investments that have been made in BMPs are coming to the end of their life in many instances. Um, I'll also point out that staffing needs and workforce and whatnot, that was not something that was pointed out early on, but now we're seeing that pop up in a couple different categories. And again, that is something that it tells us as, as an industry, maybe we need to do more training. Maybe we need to look for more workforce investment programs and, and whatnot as, as well. Okay, um, there's more to be said about all of this, of course, but um, the big, the big, one of the big takeaways for this every time, and this has really been one of the most um, impactful uh, points of information has been the funding gap. That's really what with ASCE and, and whatnot, they wanna have this information. Um, it's really good for on the hill when you go to the funding gap is this, we need this much investment, right? So for the first, uh, the first funding gap that we found um, going through this was $7.5 billion is an annual funding gap, 8.5 billion for our second one. This time we found 6.2 billion as well, but we're seeing, I mean, it's, these are billions of dollars, right? So, but relatively speaking, we're in we're in a kind of a consistent loop here we're about the average is about 7.4 7.5 whatever it is billion so we're seeing some consistency is the point if these if these numbers varied widely then i think we'd we kind of scratch our heads and say i don't know if we believe these numbers but i think the more that we get consistent responses especially when and i didn't point this out 643 um, respondents is a statistically significant amount for the population that, that we're talking about here when we're you know, at, at, at a various at, at the standard that we should be at and we've met that and exceeded that every time which is which means that the the, the data can be uh, believed I think to, to to that level so anyway so we see a consistent funding gap about seven and a half billion is the takeaway on that one we also asked for the last two not for the first um, survey but for the last two we've asked the question can the federal um, ms4 program uh, meet clean water goals in the long term, not just tomorrow, but in the long term. And a plurality in, in this survey, a plurality said no, 41% said no, that's that's not going to happen. And that's, that's a significant thing. And, and, we, and when the follow on question is why, what's the leading factor? And of course, it's lack of funding and investment, right? Not surprising to a lot of us who are in the industry, but it confirms a lot of what we have been um, experiencing and thinking. So, Again, take, putting on my Scott Taylor hat, um, uh, and, and, and as far as the takeaways are concerned, some things to think about. It's a, this is a difficult survey to administer. It's, uh, you know, it, we were hoping to get, you know, we had 600 and some respondents in the first, uh, the first survey with 800, the second one, we're like, oh, we'll, we'll get 1,000 or 1,200 or whatever now we didn't. And that, you know, there's the Clean Watershed Needs Survey has been going on, which has been really good for because EPA has invested a lot in trying to get more data uh, for stormwater. But, you know, it's just a challenging sector. It's fragmented, a lot of small communities. Um, anyway, it's just, it's been difficult, but we're still meeting that statistical significance threshold, which is great. But half the problem, uh, half, the, half the programs don't have enough money, we have found. Um, again, plus or minus, but we're seeing... And that 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 number is much higher. Actually, only thirty percent say they don't have enough, but there's a fair amount who don't even answer. And that's probably because if I say I don't have enough money, then I might be out of compliance. I don't. Again, I'm with Sean in the room here. I'm making a jump here, but anyway, there, there's a fear from answering uh, on answering this question. I think so. This number is probably much higher. Um, half the programs probably don't know don't have a whole lot of information about their infrastructure because they don't have asset management planning. This is not great. This is not great. I'm sorry. 
or they're not in the same department. Yeah, that's a good point. Yes, it's not like that. Um, and we see that most agree that the infrastructure is near the end of its service life. Again, this is an aging infrastructure issue that's come, that's rising, right? Uh, um, you know, more and more over time. So, as a as a final takeaway, here, um, it's unclear, at least from the from those who are in the programs at the local level, that the program that we're talking about here is going to meet the clean water goals at the end of the day. That's a that's a big that's a big thing. And so that means should we pivot? as a sector. These are big takeaways, I think, to think about. And that could be seen as an opportunity because we're seeing, it, we're, I think we're getting into a, to a, a level of maturation in our sector where we can say, look, we're in a replacement um, phase, right? We're starting to see the end of the, of the life in a lot of our infrastructure. When we replace and we have this aging infrastructure, we need to think about resilience planning and investment. We can, and that change, that's an opportunity to, uh, to, to, to change the discussion and the view of stormwater from the public, because we can get more green infrastructure, you know, we can get more multi-purpose investments as part of our, um, our programs and our investments overall. And that can be seen more of as a, as a resource rather than uh, just a you know, gray infrastructure move water around. Uh, and that could be potentially the opportunity for uh, a new national model. So that's, those are the big takeaways. On um, on the MS4 survey, and you know those who were involved. Any you know, Fernando, I know you were involved quite a bit. Do you have anything else that you wanted to add? Anybody else? Okay, all right. Um, I was going to give some updates on NAMSA. We're we're running a little bit light, and so I'm going to just cut to the chase for what we've been really focusing on, which is on Step. This is our biggest program. Uh, Step is is a stormwater testing and evaluation for products and practices. So you can think of this as a consumer reports for stormwater infrastructure. That's the elevator pitch for, for this. And this answers the question or tries to answer the question, how well do stormwater uh, pro products and practices, meaning proprietary products and uh, public domain practices, how well do they work or perform? And you know, the problem statement is that there's no national organization doing this. So WEF actually started this a number of years ago. NAMSA has picked up the ball and has been running it um, for the last couple of years. Um, and, and so that's, this is what the acronym is about. And you can see what our goal is to, to establish this um, multi-state or national testing and evaluation program um, for, the, for the betterment of our industries. We wanna have more increased overall performance. We don't wanna lower the playing field. We wanna increase the playing field, increase the transparency on performance. And overall, you know, if we see this as a value in investing in, in stormwater infrastructure, we want to make sure that folks, uh, the public, those who are paying for it, have some confidence that it's going to perform at a certain level. So, and at the end of the day, it's going to improve water quality. We, over the last year, we've done a couple of surveys, one targeting MS4s, one targeting state regulators, asking them a bunch of questions. I'm going to show you results for two questions. One of the, the first question is, does your state or your MS4 currently rely on, on, on some kind of performance-based testing program? Or do you just, just use uh, products willy-nilly? And it's hard to see all this up, up there, but, but about a third of states said that they do, and a little over 40% of MS4 say they do. Uh, that, 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 that they do not, I'm sorry. So there's a big need for some kind of program at the national level. Um, and we asked if there was a national program like STEP that was developed and launched, would you use it, would rely on it? And over 80% of both states and MS4s so that they would. So that's, um, that shows that there's still a need uh, and a demand for this in the sector. So just a couple quick updates on STEP. We've, we've targeted a, a three phase uh, pathway to get to a full launch. We just, we're finishing phase one right now, which was 2021, 2022. So for the next year, year and a half, we're going to be going to phase two, I'm sorry, phase one was the development phase, phase two is transition. So we're transitioning to a fully operational uh, program. So that's gonna be this year, next year, uh, but we're really focusing on lab testing. And the, some of the takeaways here is that we have been going through fundraising for phase two, and we more than exceeded our fundraising goal. And our fundraising goal was twice as big as it was in phase one. So we've got some folks who are members of STEP, which I appreciate um, here. And it's not just industry, it's mostly industry, but we've got some um, local governments that, that are involved with this as well. So 
this is showing that there's still confidence that this program is moving forward. Um, and the, and the, I guess the big takeaway is that we're going to launch this program July 1, focusing on trash capture technologies based upon lab testing. And that's um, based upon the fact that we've got some ASTM testing standards that have been developed, which is the basis for what we're doing. So um, a couple other updates is that, um, sorry, these are all out of order. Uh, we're gonna continue our engagement outreach because we need to make sure that both you know, EPA headquarters as well as regional offices are aware and are supportive of what we're doing. Um, we're gonna try to get some of that money from the centers of excellence because we feel like STEP really ties right into that, um, the spirit of, of what that's about. Um, we're, we're starting with trash capture technologies in July. By the end of this year, we're going to be uh, focusing on sediment. So we're going, basically going to be able to do any kind of testing and evaluation that any other state or national program that exists out there can do um, by late 2023, early 2024, which is primarily the New Jersey program. And they're gonna continue to develop our uh, field testing program as well in the future. So, so with that, I will, uh, if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer it. I know that we're late and it's been a long day, so I don't want to belabor any of this, but I'll be around. So if you have any questions, let me know. And I will give way to Bianca. <laughs> thank you, Seth. And thank you, really, everyone. I guess like we're here at the wrap up, the tail end of it. And I just wanted to take the opportunity to one, thank everyone here for joining us in this uh, stormwater policy forum. Again, one of WEF's goal is to continue to um, elevate and see the water quality in all its different aspects, including stormwater. So we're hoping to continue to advocate and bring the issues that the stormwater sector has to the front table um, and just en engage with the different players, right? Um, and in that, I just want to thank um, our speakers who join us today on the climate change and the emerging contaminants um, panel, as well as the EPA panel, the time that you took to prepare and be here, and as well as you here sharing your thoughts and your perspectives. I think it is really important to just um, continue to collaborate and continue to see what is happening on one side versus the other and continue to exchange that because that's how we can come together and continue to elevate stormwater. Um, and with that, I guess, uh, yeah, again, thank you. So oh, I wanted to take an opportunity to thank uh, of the planning committee that helped us put together and brainstorm uh, the, the groups, including um, some folks in the, in the room, Randy, Brandon, I know Fernando, uh, Seth, Steve and um, Lisa Deason as well. So thank you for, for your time and contributing to this effort. And as well as thank you at NACO and NLC for letting us uh, use this space. Uh, slides. Yes. Slides. Yes, so we will be distributing the slides to all the attendees um, and online and in person. So um, we'll be sending that after this, this event. So, yeah. Thank you so much. And again, thanks for attending. And if you want to join us for an informal reception, we'll be at the Dub Dubliner. <laughs>